This was the May 4th, 2021 meeting of the City of Charleston Board of Zoning Appeals, Zoning. President are Mr. Morrison, Mr. Jadon, Ms. Grass, Ms. Vargas Vargas, Mr. Bennett, and Mr. Robinson. Present from the planning staff are Mr. Batchelder, Ms. Ashby, and Mr. Valentine. These proceedings are being recorded. We ask that those who speak identify themselves for the record. We'll conduct this meeting in usual fashion. We'll first receive information from city staff about the application and their recommendation. If the recommendation is favorable and no one objects to the application, usually the Board of Zoning Appeals treats the matter as being uncontested and passes it as a matter of course. If, however, the city recommends against the application or there is opposition to the application, we treat the application as contested and hear from the applicant and anyone else who is in favor of the application. Next, we hear from anyone opposed, followed by a short rebuttal from the applicant. We then close the public hearing portion of the meeting for that particular application in open discussion to the Board of Zoning Appeals members only. We'll then make a decision to approve, approve with conditions or deny the application. The Board of Zoning Appeals only has the authority to do three things. First, to hear appeals to decisions of the zoning administrator. Second, to grant special exceptions, a fact-finding function of the board. And third, to grant variances to the zoning ordinance if the application meets the hardship test outlined in section 54-924 of the ordinance. The board may deliberate and make a final decision on a matter by a majority vote of members present at the hearing and qualified to vote, provided that not less than a quorum is present and qualified to vote. However, an affirmative vote of two thirds of the board members present and voting shall be required for before a use variance may be granted. For a variance to be granted, the Board of Zoning Appeals must make the following findings. A, that there are extraordinary and exceptional conditions <clears throat> pertaining to the particular piece of property. B, these conditions do not generally apply to other property in the vicinity. C, because of these conditions, the application of the ordinance to the particular piece of property would effectively prohibit or unreasonably restrict the utilization of the property. And D, the utilization of a variance will not be of substantial detriment to adjacent property or to the public good, and the character of the district will not be harmed by the granting of the variance. As a matter of business, I would like to tell everyone present that the rules and regulations of the Board of Zoning Appeals allows for the applicant and anyone else in favor of the application to have 10 minutes to present the total to present their case. The opposition in turn has a 10 minute uh, time period to make their statements and the uh, applicant has a time limit of three minutes to rebut the opposition. The chairman may at, at his prerogative utilize this time consideration in the, in the conduct and in, in the hearing of any one application. First item on the agenda is a review of the minutes and deferred applications from the uh, uh, April 20th, 2021 20, board meeting. Everyone received a copy of those minutes and is there a motion to approve those minutes? Mr. Morrison votes for approval, seconded by Mr. Judon. All in favor signify by saying aye. Mr. Morrison. Aye. aye. Mr. Judon. Aye. Ms. Grass. Aye. Ms. Vargas Vargas. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Robinson, aye. The minutes are unanimously approved. The second item on the agenda is one that I have to recuse from, and I'm going to ask Mr. Morrison 
to act as chairman in the hearing of item number A2 on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. First item, 48 Society Street in Ansonboro requests a use variance under section 54-203 to allow a salon with days of operation Tuesday through Saturday and hours of operation 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. in an STR single and two family residential zone district. Owner WMJR LLC and applicant, Mr. And Mrs. Edward and Lada Jackson. Mr. Batchelder. This is a <clears throat> property that sits on the corner of Anson and Society Street in Ansonboro. And uh, it has a two-story building that's been used in the past for many years uh, on the ground floor as a non-residential use uh, corner store type building. Uh, you'll hear from the applicant about the history of the building going way back. Uh, there was a grocery store on the ground floor for many, many years up until the 60s. And then uh, a travel agency on the ground floor the upstairs, uh, as I understand it, has been used as an apartment for many years, and uh, that is not the issue tonight. It's the ground floor or part of the ground floor that is the issue tonight. And uh, <clears throat> the zoning of the property is residential, which is why we're here tonight. Uh, this corner store, like many corner stores in the residential area, has a residential zoning same as the surrounding properties. And uh, that means that we have to uh, deal with these kinds of issues, the non-residential uses of these properties from time to time. And, uh, and many corner stores and other neighborhoods have received use variances or uh, special exceptions as the uh, situation might uh, dictate for a variety of commercial uses. Uh, the <clears throat> issue tonight uh, has gotten a little bit confusing. And so um, here you see a, a property, uh, a picture of the property rather. And you see that it has a entrance on the corner or near the corner of the building with the intersection into the ground floor space. That is not that space along Anson Street right here, which runs up the right side of this photograph, is not the space in question. It's the space on the other half of the building, the western half. And uh, the issue has gotten confusing in that I initially asked the applicants to file an application for a use variance, not being sure exactly what the history was on the commercial use in this ground floor. Uh, I didn't know the recent history at least, and I didn't know for sure how their business license might have been approved in the past. I could not find any records. And, um, and so that created some initial confusion. Since that time, I've learned a lot and information has been obtained that helps to understand how the owner's use of the ground floor space um, <clears throat> was initially, I think, uh, approved and how it operated there for many years. And the owner, <clears throat> you'll hear more about this, but the owner has a business. It's a uh, sort of retail, wholesale retail, uh, studio business, but they don't retail out of this location. It's an office for that business, I believe. And uh, so <clears throat> they have a business. They've had a business in this location for many years with a valid business license issued from the city. And with a valid business license for non-residential use of this space, the space we're talking about tonight, um, the conversion of that space to some other non-residential use uh, <clears throat> in this situation becomes, in my opinion, 
a zoning special exception, uh, whereby <coughs> under <coughs> section 54-110, there's a subsection that speaks to uh, allowing the board, rather allowing or having a deciding factor in whether uh, a non-conforming use can change to a different non-conforming use uh, based on a finding that the proposed non-conforming use is equally or more appropriate than the existing non-conforming use. So that's a special exception under section 54.110. And that existing use for the uh, owner's business in this location, in my opinion, means that they or uh, that the applicants are rather asking for a special exception to change part of the ground floor space to a salon use. And you'll hear more about that. I think they're opposing views on that. So, uh, but let me just show you a few more slides here. Um, so here's a <clears throat> image again of the corner entrance. And again, that half of the property along Anson Street, which would be this right half of the building on the ground floor, that's not the space we're talking about tonight. We're talking about the other half, those two windows to the left of the Palmetto tree on the ground floor. That space has its own separate entrance and it's right here through this doorway, which comes off of this uh, parking lot um, on the west side of the building. This is a view of the property, 48 Society Street property. Uh, it has that two-story porch overlooking this parking lot, curb cut off of Society Street. And uh, it's been like this for many, many, many years. Um, the applicant filed their application back in April, and uh, the, um, <clears throat> the matter was deferred once. And... Uh, they submitted all this information to us with their application. Um, but here's the floor plan, and I'll just talk about this briefly and, and a couple other things. This is the floor plan. <clears throat> uh, both floor plans are identical. They're both the first floor of the building. Uh, the, the difference between these two plans is that one gives you the gross square footage for each half, basically for each part of the building. So the main building is this, let me turn my laser point on. The main part of the building is this portion right here, the square with the masonry walls. That um, <clears throat> has a gross square footage of about 1156. Then you have this rear addition, wood frame addition uh, that has a different square footage, smaller square footage. This, on the right hand side just breaks it down by room, the square footages. Uh, but the, the space we're talking about tonight is this western half right here. So basically three rooms and a bathroom entered through this doorway right here and this doorway right here uh, off of the parking lot. <clears throat> now what, what I did discover in doing some research on this property and I overlooked it because I got a bunch of emails and I was just um, unfortunately overlooked it in my batch of emails, but I did find where there's uh, a copy in our archive records of an application for a business license and certificate of occupancy that was submitted back in 2004 um, you see the date, this was faxed into the city and back when we used fax machines. And uh, <clears throat> it speaks to the business that's been operating there for many years uh, by the name of Pixie Lily. And at that time, I believe, and the applicants can correct me, but I believe the travel agency may have still been operating in a portion of the ground floor. So this was taking one smaller space of the ground floor for this business. And, and after that, my understanding is that the business grew, they occupied more of the 
ground floor, eventually occupying all of the ground floor. And, and more recently, the building underwent major renovations, which caused the uh, use of the building to lapse, but that's okay. That doesn't create any problems. Uh, people have to move out of houses, businesses have to move out of buildings while major renovations are taking place. So that's not an issue. It's just simply the fact that there was no, there's no record of a certificate of occupancy that was ever issued by the city and with this business license. And, uh, and under the code of the city of Charleston, for a business to operate, they have to not only obtain a business license for the location, they also have to obtain what is called a certificate of occupancy that sets forth the occupancy limit for that business in a particular location. We don't have a record of that, but I think my, my guess is that there's simply no record in our files because the record keeping on these kinds of things from back in the two, early 2000s was not all that great. So sometimes we have records of those documents, sometimes we don't, and apparently here we don't. But I still think that this was a licensed business properly uh, CO'd back in the early 2000s. And, um, and that's why I feel it's a special exception to change a non-conforming use to a different non-conforming use rather than a use variance. I didn't know all this back when this um, uh, application, well, back when this issue first came up, I certainly didn't know all this, but I've learned. So I think, uh, and you'll hear on the issues, the merits of the case, concerns about traffic and the type of business that this would be. And, uh, you know, this is a, has always been for many years, a pretty low key commercial operation in the ground floor of this building. Um, and uh, so the type of business that is being proposed conceivably would generate more traffic. And that is a concern of neighbors nearby and my, charge to the applicants was go talk to those neighbors and the neighborhood association and see what they thought. And uh, I think there's been a pretty overwhelming uh, uh, response of, of opposition. I know there are people in the neighborhood who are in support as well, but I think there's been a lot of opposition for these reasons and probably others that you'll hear. So I I feel like uh, the application should not be approved uh, in light of that opposition and those concerns. And that's my position. I don't feel that this would be uh, equally or more appropriate than the uh, previous commercial use, the Pixie Lily business. Okay, Mr. Batchelder, thank you, sir. Uh, it, uh, do I understand as an attorney on behalf of the applicant to speak? That's correct. And I can um, get him into the meeting. I can find him. Oh, there he is. Okay. and promoting Mr. Maslon to be a panelist. And I would ask him once he joins the meeting to advise me on whether anybody else on, the, on behalf of the application would like to be uh, heard and, and I can join, add them to the panelists as well. Thank you, Mr. Batchelder. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board, I'm John Massillon, and I am here on behalf of the building owners. Uh, you heard that it is a company called WMJR LLC, but the owners of that are Edward and Leda Jackson. So, I'll and John, let me just interrupt you before you get going on that. 
would you like me to add any more of your applicant uh, members to the panelist? Uh, and I appreciate that. I was going to address that briefly. Um, uh, mindful of um, Chairman Robertson's Robinson's uh, time limits, I will be the only one speaking for the owners. However, I understand that Mr. and Mrs. Jackson have a neighbor with them uh, named Larry Jones, who said that he tried to, to sign up to talk and was not able to get through. And I, I think he would like to be heard if he can get uh, on the um, on the list of speakers, but Mr. Okay. and Mrs. Jackson are not going to speak. Okay, thank you. And let me swear you in before you get going. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and my, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, Mr. Batchelder, can you enable me to share my screen or either pull up my um, submission, one of the two on your screen? I can pull it up on my screen. Okay. Uh, there was so, just a timeline that was included, and I was going to uh, touch on a few. Um, would be a little earlier than that. I think. The did I already pass it? I, I so. haven't seen it yet. Um, so okay. if you click down a little further, there's right there's here. That's it. Okay, good. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the board, um, as as you've heard. Uh, we are here uh, under 54110C asking for a special exception to approve the western half of the ground floor of this building to be used as a salon. Uh, I've submitted a pretty extensive history of the building. Uh, I'd like to touch on just a few things to reinforce uh, the use and the fact uh, that we believe clearly this is an existing non-conforming use in this district, and so a special exception would be the appropriate standard. As you can see from my timeline, uh, the current building was constructed around 1839. If you skip down a few entries, uh, the information we have is that from about 1875 to 1927, uh, a gentleman named George Von Osen operated a bakery there on the first floor. Uh, after he passed away, the building was sold to Atlantic Savings. We don't know for sure, but based on the ownership, we assumed it was used uh, for bank purposes from 1927 to 37. Uh, then it was sold uh, to Mrs. Clausen. And in 1940, it became Kessler's Market. And uh, beginning in 1940, it was used consistently as a market, the entire ground floor until about the mid 60s, 1966, if you skip down a few items, uh, you'll see that a florist was located there briefly. And then um, in 1969, Mr. Kessler sold the building to William McIntosh, who is Mrs. Jackson's grandfather. And uh, from that point until about 2005, it operated as McIntosh Travel there on the corner of, of Anson and Society Streets. Um, after um, uh, Ms. Jackson's grandfather um, uh, stopped working in the business, her father took it over and operated it until 2005. Now, um, in 2005, actually in 2004, as you've seen from the information supplied by Mr. Batchelder, um, Mrs. Jackson and her mother um, formed a, a children's clothing business and began operating out of that location. Um, you may hear some talk or some, some discussion about uh, there never having been a, um, a business license, CO issued to that business, but, but as Mr. Batchelder has, has advised the board, we believe that the application and the fact that the business license has been consistently renewed at that location for years uh, is, is proof positive that, that it was an operating existing non-conforming use. And eventually uh, that business took over the, the ground floor of the building. In 2018, uh, Mrs. Uh, McIntosh passed away and that's when the ownership of the building passed to its current owners, uh, WMJR uh, LLC. And, and Mr. Batchelder, if you could go to my next slide, please. Or my next uh, page. 
this slide is, is outdated. Anyway, um, uh, if, if, if you look, um, this, this is a chronology of the renovations that were performed uh, at the building. And starting in early 2019, the building was very extensively renovated. And I won't go through all the details of it, but essentially uh, the permit was issued, looks like in April of 2019, the renovations were finished uh, in the fall, uh, late, late fall of 2020. Uh, as far as, as the current use of the building, uh, as Mr. Batchelder said, um, the west, the, the, the property is currently divided so that it can be used, the ground floor can be separated into different uses. And if Mr. Batchel, if you could go up a few pages to that floor plan briefly. Keep going. It was the one that had Maven written, uh, if you remember which one that was. There we go. Um, and, and as it's currently configured, you see um, where the words Maven are written in the left-hand floor plan. That's the space that we're, we're here talking about today. It, it enters from Society Street, Street. It's got parking, off-street parking, entering in from Society Street. And my clients have signed a lease with the uh, owners, operators of Maven, which until now have been operating over at 10 Exchange. And they like to move uh, their uh, uh, salon from Exchange Street to this location. Now, um, the um, once the the uh, use was known, the neighbors raised a number of concerns. And as Mr. Batchelder told you um, uh, early on, there was a lot of information that wasn't known about the building. So my clients applied for variance, um, but uh, we're here asking for a special exception. Um, for the reasons that I've already described. Uh, as you all know well by now, the, the test is equally or more appropriate to the district. And uh, the proposed use we believe is equally or more appropriate to this district for the following reasons. First, uh, the tenants of Ms. Workman and Ms. LaCroix who own Maven are experienced operators. They've been running the salon uh, at 10 Exchange Street for a number of years. And so they are experienced and, and have a good grasp of the operating requirements. Uh, I'm, I'm told they also live in the neighborhood. So this isn't just a work situation for them. They're invested in the quality of life and livability in Ansonboro. Uh, we haven't talked about this uh, significantly, but, but the lease includes four off-street parking spaces that, that one enters from from Society Street and there's, and Mr. Batchelder, I believe we've got a picture of the parking if you could perhaps uh, scroll down to that. Um, and he... Mr. Maslon, we've, we've seen that parking. We've been okay. with that. Gotcha. Okay, um, the, um, the space, uh, just a rough calculation of it's between six and 700 square feet. So. Not a big space, um, and um, the the tenants and their attorney uh, Ben Trawick are actually signed up to speak. So I'll let them uh, address the specifics of the traffic and parking and how they plan to manage it uh, during their time. Um, there there will be no signs allowed on the facade. Only a small sign will be allowed in the window that can be seen from the parking lot. So there won't be any big salon signs. Any Thing that would be disruptive to the streetscape. My understanding is this is not going to be a full service spa or salon. And again, I'll let Mr. Trawick or his client speak directly to that, but, but I think the services offered there will be limited. Uh, the hours of operation would be Tuesday to Saturday, nine to five. So not a seven day a week business um, closed on Sunday and Monday. Uh, there are concerns that we have, have seen about um, events at, at this uh, location. My understanding is, and again, Mr. Trawick can speak more authoritatively to this, but my understanding is that 
Most of the Saturday events are in support of weddings and conducted offsite and not in the salon. Um, uh, the, I don't expect that the salon itself is going to generate significant foot traffic on society or car traffic because uh, they're just going to be two cosmetologists working there. I don't uh, believe they have any other cosmetologists that work with them and no support staff. So just the two of them uh, working there with a fairly low volume clientele. As far as um, uh, deliveries and waste disposal, uh, my understanding is, is they get relatively small deliveries of you know, beauty products and salon products that you'd be familiar with, but there aren't gonna be any big delivery trucks bringing in things that might support something like a restaurant or big retail operation. Uh, the, um, the trash and garbage disposal will be just like a residence, one trash can, one recycling bin. Uh, we're not aware of any specialized waste disposal or hazardous products or anything of that nature. Um, you may have heard or will hear that um, Miss LaCroix, one of the owners has appeared on the television show, Southern Charm. And I am aware that there is concern in the neighborhood about that and whether there would be impacts uh, from that uh, on the neighborhood. Again, I'll let Mr. Treywick and his clients address that specifically, but we propose that the special exception be approved with the condition that there can be no outside filming, no filming of the facade, no filming of the neighbors, and that if there is filming, that it will all be inside and there'll be a limit of three people. Uh, I believe that would be a producer and two cameramen that would be needed and they would either park in the off street parking or at the Gilliard parking uh, lot a couple of blocks away. Um, so we would propose that as a condition of approval. Um, to um, it, advance a couple of uh, objections that we've heard, um, as Mr. Batchelder mentioned, um, he suggested uh, a meeting with the neighborhood. My understanding is that the, the neighborhood uh, met and, and voted to oppose this without ever meeting or talking with uh, my clients. Uh, in mid-March, they actually distributed letters to their neighbors um, uh, about the project, gave them phone numbers, uh, invited them to call. But uh, my understanding is that Hannah did not take them up on that and met, decided to oppose this without talking to them. Um, Mr. Jim Rice, the, the president, did come over at the invitation of the Jacksons and tour the property and met with them. Uh, subsequently, when I got involved, I asked for a meeting with them to talk about their concerns. Mr. Batchelder was kind enough to offer to meet with us as well. The response that I got back was that they uh, were not interested in meeting with me. And when I asked Mr. Rice if uh, he could tell me why they weren't interested in meeting with me, uh, he couldn't tell me that either. So we understand their concerns. Uh, we did attempt outreach, but um, the, the response we got back was, no, thank you. We don't want to meet with you or discuss it. Uh, very briefly, um, I, during, uh, during the public comment, we do expect to have a number of people from the neighborhood that support this use and support the Jacksons and Aspen for this special exception. But you, you're certainly going to hear some opposition. Uh, and uh, to address that briefly, what I think you'll hear first is uh, that this was a non-conforming use that lapsed. I believe that the timeline and the information we provided to city staff has conclusively uh, rebutted that. And I don't think there's any question that it's been a continuous non-conforming use, at least since 1940, probably before that. Uh, as far as the certificate of occupancy issue, again, um, we've got the application back uh, in 2004 for this business. Um, we don't have the actual CO, but as Mr. Batchelder has said, uh, going back that far, the records aren't that good. Uh, we don't know what happened with it. And, and if you look closely at the, at the application, it was submitted by Ms. Jackson's mother, who is passed now. And so she's not a resource that's available to us to, to find out any more information about that. But um, like Mr. Batchelder, I believe that a uh, business license CO was issued. 
Um, uh, there is a tenant in the eastern half of this property, uh, a public relations firm named Ballyhoo. And um, uh, when uh, we became engaged uh, in this, these issues with the city, uh, there was a question raised about whether they had a business license CO. Uh, again, in my view, that is not an issue for the board tonight. If it's anything, it's an enforcement issue. And my understanding is they submitted an application for that today. But uh, if you hear about that, my view of it is at most it's an enforcement issue, but it doesn't affect the special exception analysis. Finally, um, uh, as far as the um, uh, use uh, of, of the building itself, um, this is, Jackson has been using the second floor for Pixie Lily since the uh, PR firm moved in and in the expectation that she was going to uh, have the salon move in as well. Uh, you may hear some talk about that. Again, I don't believe that that has anything to do with the special exception request for tonight, uh, but uh, my clients understand that if they um, wanna use that space as commercial, currently it's configured as an apartment, and, and I believe historically it has been, that they either need to move out and, and get a residential tenant in there or they need to come back to this board and ask for a variance, but that is not on the agenda for tonight, but you may hear some discussion about it during the opposition. Um, so in sum, I, I believe that, that what you've heard and what you will hear proves that this is an equally or um, uh, e equally appropriate use for uh, this particular building that won't disrupt the quality of life in the neighborhood or adversely affect the surrounding properties. And I ask that you approve this special exception request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maslon. Um, when did you want us to hear from Mr. Larry Jones, Mr. Maslon? Well, um, what, what, and I don't wanna um, try to take over the meeting, but I, I'd suggest it would be most informative perhaps to hear from the tenants next. That would be Mr. Trawick and I believe Ms. Workman uh, are, are here and let them tell you about the business and their vision for it and, and how they see it operating. And then perhaps after that, Mr. Jones can have his say. He's with Mr. and Mrs. Jackson. And Mrs. Workman is one of the uh, proposed tenants with and Ms. That, LaCroix. That's, that's correct. Uh, the, the owners of Maven are Ms. Workman and Ms. LaCroix and their attorney is Ben Trawick. Uh, all right. Can we connect Mr. Trawick now, Mr. Batchelder? And, and Mr. Morrison, my, my client just texted me to correct me. She says that um, Mr. Jones might need to go ahead and speak because he's got a time limitation. So perhaps if I could reverse myself and let him have his say. And then I think that'll be all right. We've got time limitations ourselves. He, he'll be quick, I'm sure, if he's connected. Can we... Okay. So if you could perhaps connect Ms. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jackson, and then uh, I, I, he's got to I, six. You're not going to connect Mr. Joe? I'm lost. I thought we were going to get Mr. Trawick now, and then Mr. Jones said he's got it. Oh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to confuse the dialogue. My client is telling me that apparently David Rawl is the one that would like to go ahead and speak because he's got to leave at six. So um, if Mr. Rawl could, um, could address the issue and then go to Mr. Trawick. I'm looking for Mr. Rawl on the list and I know I saw his name. It's just a matter of finding him. Got a long list here. And thank you for that accommodation. I, I believe Mr. Rawl has to leave it six. I don't see him. On...
Mr. Batchelder, if you don't see him immediately, let's push on to Mr. Trawick. The lawyers are going to be the longest, I presume, and we've got to keep this moving. Okay. If we Mr. Trawick? Yes, sir. Uh, let me swear you in. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Massillon covered a lot of the ground that I wanted to cover, and I am also mindful of everyone's time. So I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit to just, just emphasize a few points. Um, and I appreciate y'all's time. Um, in terms of the appropriateness of the proposed use and the expected impacts on the neighborhood, I want to touch on a few of the concerns that the community has expressed as we understand it and address them. When I look at sort of the list of things that have been raised, it really falls into three categories. And one of them is concerns about parking. The second one is um, the fact that one of the salon's owners, one of my clients, um, Miss LaCroix has appeared on Southern Charm, the television program. And then the third kind of group of concerns relate to um, just sort of the possibility of excessive noise and crowds. Um, on the first one, the question of whether there will be adequate parking, for all the reasons that Mr. Massillon said, we think that four parking spaces for this small business is more than adequate for the reasons that he outlined. I'll just point out also that this is, if I'm reading Mr. Batchelder's uh, sort of plat correctly, um, th th this, this business, I've, I've walked through it. I mean, we're talking about 600, 650 square feet um, of, of space um, with four parking spaces provided. Um, maybe even less than that. Either way, it's, it's a parking space for every 150 square feet. Um, and my understanding, if this was a new project and the city was establishing the, you know, the parking requirements for a, a business of that size and this type, it, the requirement would probably be two, um, one every four or 500 square feet. Recognizing that there are differing interpretations of the parking ordinance, I, I can't imagine one. I haven't seen one that could possibly require more than the four parking spaces um, that we have um, for this use. Um, that's sort of ex sort of accentuated by the fact that both of the owners um, live right up the street and will be walking to work, which is an important um, element of their decision to, to lease this space. In any event. Parking issues are a big deal. I've fought for neighborhoods on that subject. In this, it's a perfectly valid concern, which we have a lot of respect for, but in this case, we'd submit to the board that we have addressed that adequately, more than adequately. On the subject matter of the second sort of group of concerns, they cluster around the fact that Madison LaCroix, one of my clients, one of the two owners, um, has appeared on Southern Charm. She doesn't currently have a contract to appear on um, subsequent seasons, but let's assume, and I think the board has to assume that she will, and we understand that. And we've got, once again, a great deal of respect for that concern. We understand that it's valid. Um, what, what I would say is that in addition to the, the specific limitations um, that, that we've uh, sort of volunteered, um, no exterior filming, no depictions of the neighbors of their property, um, and uh, parking of any production vehicles either in our off-street parking or down at the Gill Yard, in addition to that, I just want to point out um, that what, what we are and are not talking about, Charleston has had um, a lot of, you know, a, a sort of an explosion of television and movie filming in recent years. It's caused some problems. I'm thinking in particular, I live in Mount Pleasant. Over there, they, had, they were filming that show, uh, Outer Banks, last year. And every time you drove down uh, Royal Avenue through the old village, you'd see you know, tractor trailers full of technical equipment. Uh, you know, a fleet of bands for catering and, um, you know, streets blocked off, costume, all that stuff. Um, that is not what we're talking about. We are quite literally talking about a single SUV, um, just like one that, you know, any number of us drive, um, <coughs> a producer and two cameramen coming inside, parking off street and coming inside to do some filming. And that is all. Um, whatever <coughs> remain from that, uh, you know, is, is you know, possibly a matter of taste, but in any event, certainly people can have whatever concerns they have that remain. But in terms of the number of people um, that are going to be introduced into the environment as a result of that going on, in terms of the number of the, the amount of vehicular traffic, it's going to be no different than a roofing crew or a landscape crew who provides services all over that neighborhood every day. Um, 
on the subject of just sort of this generalized concern about excessive crowds and noise, um, this is a low volume appointment only salon. It's not open at night. It's not open on Sundays. It's work on Saturdays, as you'll hear from Ms. Workman in a minute, is almost all off site um, because they do hair for um, groups of, you know, for wedding parties and they do it at the hotel or at the wedding venue or at the reception venue. There'll be no groups of bridesmaids coming into this location. Um, there's no late night revelers. There's no alcohol service. There's no noxious odors or, or toxic waste or any of these things that we sort of, or, or litter um, or people out at all hours. None of the things that we associate with high impact, you know, unwanted high impact, high volume uses that really truly have no place in Ansonboro. And what I'd suggest to the board is that really this is, is, is not that type of use. It's a low impact use. And the, you know, I kind of racked my brain today trying to figure out what is the closest analog for the type of, of business that we're looking to run here. And you'll get some more of the context from Ms. Workman. But I, you know, it's not, at first I thought, you know, it's not totally unlike a, a lawyer's office where you have clients coming in one at a time to meet for a couple of hours um, with, you know, with, with, with trained professionals. Um, and then a, a colleague of mine suggested that what it's really most like is a, is a by appointment um, bridal shop, like the one that is up on, I think, Jasper Street right now, or the one that used to operate until just recently, uh, two blocks up the street at Hazel and Anson. I think it's 35 Hazel Street. Um, it's very low impact. It's all by appointment. And the total volume of people coming in and out of there is much lower on a typical day is much lower than what you would have for these high impact uses that validly generate these noise and crowd concerns. Um, again, we recognize that these are valid concerns and we'd simply suggest to y'all that the, that, the, that, the, that the applicant um, and the tenant have validly addressed those concerns. And in, in the absence of something more, um, we ought to be able to, to, to be found to have to have addressed that validly. Um, Mr. Trawick, this is Howell Morrison. Um, what, why does a tenant want to move here from the Exchange Street site? Great question. Um, and I, I'd like to, uh, Ms. Workman is going to answer that, but the, the answer is um, they live around the corner um, and they don't, want, they don't want a high visibility, walk-in, foot traffic site. They want a, it's a very, not to, they want a very exclusive very private, very intimate site for a low volume of high-end um, haircutting, and 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 it's it's. I think they're charging. I mean, I think I think they're making more money than everybody on this call. You know, doing um, hair, and so I mean, I say how many like, how many chairs total in the salon for patrons? They're going to they're going to have a total of four, with three. People didn't, didn't Mr. Maslon say th three people would be working in there? It, just, just two, two. The, the two owners are the only people who are gonna be working in that. Um, with, in that. With, with four chairs? Correct. And, and the reason for that is, and I'll, I, I'd like Ms. Workman to, to, to address it specifically because I obviously do not know the inner workings of the business. But the expectation is that they're going to have um, a maximum, they typically see one client um, at a time. Um, they have got, uh, it's a cool, they've ordered this, I think it's an Italian thing that has a mirror and two seats on either side um, that allows them to see two at a time, but typically they are going to see one and they think that the total volume of people coming in and out of there is going to be no more than 10 in a given day and that includes themselves. Um, it, they're not barbers. Um, these are sort of upmarket hair stylings. Okay, unless there are any questions from anybody else on the board, we'll thank you. We'll hear from Ms. Workman now. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Trawick. Thank you all. And just for the board's information, we're standing right now at about uh, 29 minutes. So I'm. Right, well, if you take the next. Speaker, we'll ask her to get through it quickly. Yes, and Miss Workman, are you on? Yes, sir. I'm okay, here. Let me square you in. Let me square you in. Uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
Um, hello, everybody. My name is Meg Workman. I am the co-owner of Maven Salon, which I own and operate with my business partner, Madison LaCroix. We would love to formally introduce ourselves as your neighbors because we are both residents here on Society Street. She lives with her eight-year-old son, Hudson, and I live with my soon-to-be husband, who is a recent medical school graduate working here in Charleston. After I graduated from college, I knew I had to pursue my dream of working in the beauty industry, and that is how I ended up here 10 years ago. As you know, Charleston wouldn't be Charleston without the good work done by this board and by planning and zoning staff, and we genuinely respect this important process. As a resident of the neighborhood, I respect the board's role in keeping the character of Anson Borough that we all know and love. While we disagree with some positions taken by Anson Borough residents who oppose this application, our disagreement is very respectful because we understand that a neighborhood belongs to the people who live there, who own property there, and who call it home. Our vision when we decided to open Maven was exactly that, for our clients to feel as if it was an extension of our home. Let me be perfectly clear that we have no desire whatsoever to change this wonderful community. In fact, we're quite horrified at the thought and we are 100% committed to making sure our business doesn't bring any unwanted impacts to the neighborhood. Last year, we knew it was time to expand into our dream location, but it had to fit our brand, a private, intimate, high-end, low-volume salon staffed by two stylists and two stylists only, Madison and myself. Our work is strictly by appointment only, with no walk-ins as we simply cannot accommodate anyone other than our handful of appointments daily. 48 Society is a perfect fit for this vision. The stress-free option to provide parking to our clients was a non-negotiable in choosing our next location. Our space can only be accessed through the back door, which opens onto a private parking lot and is perfect for our business model. I also want to point out that there will be no public signage on either Einson or Society. We are established businesswomen and do not need nor want that advertisement for our business. We do not want high visibility, high volume, or heavy foot traffic. Had that been our vision, King, Meeting, or Broad Street would have been the location desired. As we all know right now, there are many available options in those areas. We love the space on Society Street precisely because of Anson Burrow's quiet charm, and we wouldn't dream of disturbing it. I want to address head on the question I'm sure you've all been wondering, the fact that Madison has appeared on the television program, Southern Charm. In the materials submitted with the application, we worked hand in hand with our wonderful landlords, Leda and Edward Jackson, to proactively agree to limitations designed to address the community's concerns on this point. There will be no filming on the street, no depictions of our neighbors or their property, and no production vehicles parking on the public streets. The highest possible impact will consist of a single vehicle, nothing larger than the SUV driven by countless Charlestonians, which we parked in our four off-street parking spaces or in the Gilliard Auditorium garage. Ms. Workman, um, excuse me, let me interrupt and make sure I understand one thing. I'm sorry to interrupt, but no when you say no filming on the street, does that mean no filming outside the premises or yes, no sir. filming on the street? There will be no depiction of the outside of 48 Society Street at all or anything of any of our neighbors' homes or personal property. So any filming that would be done would be strictly inside the premises? Yes, sir. Okay. Another, quick, another to... quick question, if I may. With two stylists, what do you do uh, with the third room? So as you can see, if you pull up the, um, okay, here we have, if you have the entrance, which is from the parking lot and you walk into the right to the front room, there will be a station that is set up for four seats. So as stylists, we like to have a space for our current client and then a space for our next client that's gonna be coming in for their appointment so that no one is sitting uncomfortably waiting on their service to start. Um, the biggest reason why we are moving from 10 Exchange and why we want to move to 48 Society is because we are quite literally in 300 square feet and we don't feel like we can charge the amount of money that we're charging and provide the kind of high-end service that we're trying to provide with that amount of space. Okay. One, one other, thank you. One 
another question, if I may well have you. Um, with respect to the bridesmaids groups you service, that it was suggested you would only service off premises in hotels and the like, private homes, perhaps. Uh, how how would that be controlled? What what if you had a request to uh, blow out the hair or whatever you do with bridesmaids for uh, six or eight uh, ladies? Could you not accommodate that in your premises on Society Street? Um, well, I don't want to sound any sort of way by saying this, but the kind of clients that we have actually prefer to pay us to come to them. So um, the kind of clients that we're talking about are spending anywhere between five and ten thousand dollars on their wedding day um, and prefer for us to come give them the kind of service that is extremely high end. So you would be comfortable uh, agreeing to a special condition that there would be no groups of clients to come in to the premises at one time? Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry. Keep going. Okay. Um, let's see here. So I think we were talking about the parking, uh, off street parking spaces for any of the producers or cameramen that would be coming in to uh, film inside of our salon. Um, very respectfully in our view, this limited impact um, would really occur at most a dozen, a dozen times over the course of an entire year. Um, and it does not square with the quote unquote ruckus and crowds of spectators that have been predicted by some of the concerned residents. Uh, we believe that these limitations adequately address the community's concerns, but to be clear, we are 100% open to other limitations that would put the community's mind at ease. While allowing our business plan to become a reality that we have always dreamed of. Um, the same is true of other concerns expressed by the community. One being Madison and I both have separate freelance businesses, which allow each of us to do hair and makeup only for wedding parties and perf are performed off site. Many are done throughout the country and internationally. And if the bride has chosen Charleston as their wedding destination, we travel to their location as our salon is not set up to accommodate wedding parties of any size. Two being that we understand the concerns about parking, but believe these questions have been adequately addressed in the materials submitted. The business will have four dedicated parking spaces. Madison and I walk to work and many of our clients live in Ansonboro or neighborhoods within walking distance. Third, Mark, yeah. I'm sorry, but I, I, I've got to keep this moving along, but we've, we have heard these points uh, expressed pretty well already about parking in your, your residence and the other topics. Is there anything new uh, that you haven't heard Mr. Maslon and Mr. Trawick mention that you'd like to tell us? Um, you're asking me if I have anything left to say? No, any new points. Uh, did you hear Mr. Maslon and Mr. Trawick's uh, talks? I did. I Is just wanted any, to- Any, any other different, different points you would like to make for the board that they didn't touch on already? Um, I think the only thing I really want to include is that we are not high volume like a bar, restaurant, or hotel, and that this is a very intimate, private, low volume salon that we're trying to bring to Ansonboro, and we think that it is only going to improve the community. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Any, any other questions from the board for Ms. Workman? Thank you very much, Ms. Workman. Thank you. Moving on, um, I know we have some folks that want to speak in support, and uh, we can get to that. I um, believe uh, Ms. Snowden, I'm looking for Ms. Snowden down here. Do it, Mr. Batchelder. How, how yes. many, give us an order of magnitude here. How many people are lined up? speak for and against and I think we just have two more people that want to speak in support but Penny I don't know if you know of anybody else 
Is it either Mr. Rawl or Mr. Jones ready? I don't believe Mr. Rawl is on the call on the, in the meeting right now, so I haven't seen him. Or Jones, did you say? Yeah. Uh, yes, I did see them. So let me see. Uh, there's a long list of people here. I'm sorry, but it just takes time. And I don't want to be out of order, but I can tell you who I think is in the supporter category, if that would help. Yeah, I, I am just trying, frankly, to get, I, I don't want to cut you off, but I don't want us to go two hours on this thing either. And yeah. uh, we have we have heard a lot of points made already. And uh, I know Mr. Jones lives close by. Um, and He's with Mr. and Mrs. Jackson, if you're looking for him. Say again, Mr. Maslon, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Jones is actually with Mr. and Mrs. Jackson. I can't see everybody, but if Mr. and Mrs. Jackson are on um, Lee's screen, Mr. Jones will be there. Mr. Oh. Mrs. Jackson aren't going to speak. But he is with them. No. Well, if you can connect Mr. Jackson, if he wants to make some points, I would just encourage everybody to try to help the board with new or different points or different perspectives rather than anything repetitious, if they can, please. Okay, I see um, Ladad Jackson, so let me have her to speak. One Jackson, whichever one they choose. I just unmuted it. Do you hear me? Yes. Is Mr. Jones there? Yes. Okay. Mr. Jones, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I'll be God? I do. My name is Lawrence Jones. I've been living in Anson for the better part of 35 years. I know this area very well. As a matter of fact, you go way back. I, this used to be my paper route, so I know it pretty good. And there's always been a business on this corner. And I, I remember delivering papers and so forth. And I remember using the, um, the travel agency and so forth. And um, also, uh, my wife is a hairdresser. She's been a hairdresser for close to 50 years. And, and I'm the president of her company. And I, I sort of have a pretty good knowledge of, of salons. And um, when you have a two chair salon, that's, that's not gonna be a crowded situation. The traffic is gonna be minimal at best. And if they got full parking places, that's perfect. I mean, you, you just, you couldn't have it better. Um, my wife now has a beauty salon on 48 um, Wentworth Street, which is not far from here. And she's got three chairs and just her. And, um, and literally like the, the, the lady said earlier, one person at a time comes in there, even, even with two people. And the reason how for the, um, the, uh, the extra chair, sometimes they're given a service and, and they got um, maybe color or something. They'll sit on that chair and during that time, they could do a haircut, send that person on and then, and then finish up with the color. I won't take any more of your time there, but I, I think this, this, this particular business would fit perfectly in this area and wouldn't have no effect on the people living around here. Thank, thank you, Mr. Jones. You Okay, moving on. Mr. Batchelder, yes. uh, I don't want to speak for the board in general and they may have different views, but it strikes me that we have heard a good presentation of, about in, in favor of this. And uh, we may be able to move on to the opposition at this point, unless there's somebody with different or new points to be made about issues like intensification and the like. Is there somebody that 
speaks for the Ansonburg Neighborhood Association that, that is signed up? Well, um, I don't believe Jim Rice signed up to speak. Penny, can you tell me? Um, Mr. Batchelder, um, I see a Helen Rice. So, I don't know if that's the same household or yeah. not. Well, I have a I have a uh, letter from Mr. Rice, Jim Rice of the uh, on behalf of the board of directors. He is the president of Historic Anseboro Neighborhood Association, and he writes. And let me just say this for the board, board's benefit on behalf of the board of directors of Hannah. We respectfully oppose the application for 48 Society Street for a variance that would permit the applicant to lease commercial space on the property. For the reasons set forth below, the requested variance fails to meet the variance test on each of the four criteria, and two is not permitted under the applicable city ordinances. So it goes through the variance test. There does not appear to be any extraordinary and exceptional condition. Um, and the applicant didn't make those claims on their application. The application of the ordinance would effectively, would not effectively prohibit or unreasonably restrict the utilization of property, uh, nor have there been any such claims. The authorization of the ordinance and attendant parking and volume of commercial activity would be a substantial detriment to adjacent properties of public good and the character of the historic Ansonboro neighborhood. A particular concern is the proposed new non-conforming use of salon business requiring four to five off-street parking spaces for the zoning regulations would have a significant detrimental impact to the residential nature of the neighborhood. Uh, these four to five parking spaces would likely turn over rather quickly and vastly increase daily volume um, as opposed to the current volume of two to four cars per day. And uh, goes on to speak to the zoning of the property and uh, that uh, the property is currently zoned as, as a STR, single and two-family residential, whenever, a, and then cites the, the lack of a record of a non-conforming use for the first floor of 48 Society is an expired sign permit, uh, or the last record rather, is an expired sign permit for the first financial services Low Country Real Estate Appraisers, uh, dated Ju July 25th, 2007. Uh, so this conflicts with the applicant's assertion that the property has been commercial and in continuous use for over 120 years. Thus, the property should, according to the city ordinance, conform to the current provisions of the ordinances to find an SDR district residential use only. Mr. Batchelder. Um, is that letter written, if I understood your summary from the perspective that this is a use variance application? That's correct. And that's because it was originally, it, it was advertised as a use variance, not knowing for sure what the situation was. And uh, upon finding more information, we feel, I feel that it's a special exception. The applicant feels that way too. We'll hear opposing points of view, I think, from opponents of this, so. So there is, there is opposition. Uh, there's, there are people lined up to speak in opposition who will address this issue of, of whether this is a use variance or an exception. Right. All right, before we do that, would you kindly go through again your analysis of why you believe it's not, you well, I know you originally, you explained why you originally thought it was a use variance. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it is not a use variance application? Well, after the initial conversations I had with the owners of the property, I um, was able to find some records that, uh, and, and I was provided with additional records that, uh, clearly show that they've had a business license for the Pixie Lily business at 48 Society Street for um, 
a number of years. And uh, these are not records that are kept in my office. They're kept in a different office of the city. I don't know how they keep their records and they don't have the necessary, they don't necessarily have the same requirements that uh, there are for zoning uh, approvals, which is that you can't destroy any of those records. Um, and so maybe some of those records were destroyed, I don't know. And so but before, before Pixie Lily, or maybe simultaneously at some point, Macintosh Travel was a business there for um, something like 35, 36 years. Yeah, I, I know that that was there for many years. And the lapse was for the purpose of renovation work, as we understand it? That's my understanding. All right. Well, I think what we had better do to try to get through this is to make, uh, I, want, I want to hear from the opposition specifically on the issue of whether this is a, a, what kind of an application this is before we address the criteria for one of the two specific types of applications is I think the board may need to make a decision about what kind of an application this is in order to, to have the people who wish to speak addressing the correct criteria. And yeah. Mr. Batchelder, how, how was this presented to be proposed today as a special variance? I just feel like you, I feel like the, determ the, determ the determination of what we're being asked to determine, um, to rule on is the equally or more appropriate use question, not the four element test. Right. That's that's my position, that's the applicant's position. And so Mr. Morris, do you think we need to hear from people who um, believe this should be analyzed under the four element test? Yeah, I think, I think we should give them a chance if they have. I, I, I don't think there's another lawyer signed up to speak, but the opposition letter that Mr. Batchelder summarized uh, from the officer from the uh, Historic Ansonborough Association, that gentleman was speaking from the perspective of, of the notice to the public that this was a use variance application. And, and now we are considering based on Mr. Batchelder's recommendation, to consider this as under the exception rule instead of the use variance rule. And so I'm a little concerned that those in opposition have a fair chance to address exactly what their opposition is and why. And I'm a little concerned about uh, uh, the fairness of the process so that they can address uh, the, right, the right test that we're going to vote on. So what I'm looking for is anybody in opposition who wants to speak to this issue of, of why they believe this is a use variance. If, if I may, before you do that, if I may add, the applicant um, and the attorneys um, presented the appropriate, um, equally appropriate or more appropriate use test. So if you're, I think if you're going to give people the chance to speak on, on the other test, they, they should be able to speak on that as well. So I, in, in yeah, I, I mean, what my what my anxiety is, and maybe Mr. Batchelder can allay it, but it's the notice issue to me. If it was listed in the notice as a use variance, yeah, and the opposition was operating under that uh, notice, what was it? Was there a clarification about that, Mr. Batchelder, or is this a, a recent? Well, development about uh, about this issue i we started down this road not knowing exactly what the facts were and i think we have a much clearer picture of what the facts are now although as you'll hear from opponents 
uh, the, the facts are not totally conclusive as to, because there's this missing certificate of occupancy document. And uh, if that was, if we had a record of that, then there would be no issue. It would clearly be a non-conforming use situation. And we'd be changing from one non-conforming use to a different non-conforming use. But back, going back to the beginning, I didn't know what we had here. So when the applicants were uh, anxious to get this in front of the board, so I said, well, just apply for a use variance, knowing that um, in the past, uh, when these things have come up, these issues have come up, we've decided over the course of um, the application process or the hearing itself that a lesser type of zoning standard or request was um, warranted. And well, the if, the C, if the CO issue, if, if, if it's the lack of the CO that triggered that, I'd like to speak a moment to the board before we proceed. Uh, okay. it, it seems to me that when an entity, a business is publicly in operation for all the world to see, and to have patrons, be it uh, a travel agency or, or a children's clothing design or whatever uh, Ms. Jackson's operation was, um, that Mr. Mazelon has the right point that it's, it, it is an, an enforcement issue by the city if there's no CO. But does it, does, is anybody on the board concerned specifically about the, the certificate of occupancy issue more than I am? Because I'm not really concerned about that. I'm, I'm not concerned about that um, as much, but I am concerned um, about your point about the notice, about the type of hearing we're having. Well, and... Let me, let me elaborate a, a bit on that, Ms. Grass. If opposition is here to, whatever their points in opposition for a use variance, we can certainly hear, and I would suggest we do certainly hear in opposition to the special exception as well. And we'll sort out what's relevant and what's not relevant. If these people have gone through the trouble to come here to be heard, uh, uh, we should try to hear them subject to time limitations. So I'd like to hold them down <clears throat> to a minute or two each maximum. Um, and let, let's, let's try to get through what we can on that. May, may I raise just the point of, of order briefly? Um, again, there are, my understanding is there are a number of people that are here who want to um, support the application and um, and have, have also taken the time to, to appear. Is is there some way? Uh, and again, I'm, I I don't want to unnecessarily prolong this. Are they are they are they Ansonboro residents, Mr. Mazalon? Do you know? My understanding is is that I believe all of them are, um, and I I can give you the names of the ones I know of, um, and uh, if that would help. But but I'd like that to be known in some way that there is not just opposition and me and Mr. Trawick supporting this in, in some way that's appropriate. Right, and I know there are a number of people lined up in opposition too. I, I don't want us to listen to everyone stand in line and say, I'm for and against, I'm for and against. And I like this point that was made and that point that was made because what I'm trying to do still here is find out what salient points for and against are out there that are new and have not been heard. I understand we don't have a designated spokesman for the opposition at this point. Um, and um, I might defer to you, Mr. Batchelder, since you have probably read a number of emails and have gotten calls and met with people in person to some extent, do you have a recommendation about whom we could call on at this point? So um, we do have people that did sign up to speak. And I, I think that's that's part of the process for these Zoom meetings is that you have to sign up before a certain time to speak. 
And those people, I think, are entitled to be recognized if they're if they're present and have something new to add. Of course, we don't know about their position, but um, and let me just um, also mention, and I I failed to mention this that we did receive a letter from the Historic Charleston Foundation, and they state that the Historic Charleston Foundation is not opposed to the special exception application. Uh, and uh, they speak to the healthy diversity of uses uh, that have thrived in these older neighborhoods. Um, so I'll just mention that, that they did submit that letter in support. Um, All right. Now, that is the letter that you were summarizing for us previously? No, this is a letter from the Historic Charleston Foundation. Oh, from HCF. Okay. Yep. And they do not oppose on right. the basis of their assumption that it's a special exception situation. Correct. Application. Okay. All right. So would you like me to begin identifying the people who signed up to speak? Yeah, to please opposition? do and swear them in and let's hold everybody to one minute to start with. Okay. So Penny, help me out here. Yes, sir. Um, I think we went over the list. So I'm going to just start looking for the people that I know of. Here's uh, Ms. Lipschitz, and uh, I'm going to allow her to speak. Okay. Are you there? Okay, um, maybe moving on. Oh, wait a minute. Hello, can you no. hear me? Yes. Yes, let me uh, swear you in. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please proceed. Um, I'll make it short and sweet. I live in the neighborhood. Um, I live in the neighborhood because it is a quiet residential neighborhood. I believe uh, a business of this nature will do harm to the, the in our neighborhood uh, in making it busier um, and more crowded, but with people. Um, just the fact that they need a parking lot that holds that many cars would lead me to believe that um, there will be more traffic than that small corner of Anzenberg can handle. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lipschitz. Okay. Not seeing the next person on my list. Um, Penny? Yes, um, I know. Um, John Moslin signed up to speak. Okay. Just see him. Okay. Mr. Marslin? Yes. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you God? I do. Uh, good evening. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is John Marsland. My wife and I, Carolyn, reside at 48 Society Street, which is, sorry, 49 Society Street, directly across the street from the subject property. Um, in fact, we have a full view of the property's driveway and piazzas from all three floors of our home. Uh, we are opposed to the applicant's request. Um, as requested, I actually am prepared to speak to the question of the special exception versus the variance test. Um, I believe the appropriate test in this case is the four-part variance test. The underlying businesses on the property were and remain in violation of city ordinances. And on that basis, I would argue the use was, was and remains illegal. 
illegal use cannot form the basis to assert a claim for legal continuous use. Thus, the non-conforming use should revert to a conforming use as stipulated by the statute, and the application should be subject to the variance test as originally determined. The burden is on the applicant to demonstrate that their non-conforming use is both continuous and legal as a prerequisite to a request for a special exception rather than facing the variance test. While the supplement sub submitted by the applicant goes to great length to provide historical documentation, it fails to prove continuous legality. I'm not asserting that the nature of the businesses is illegal, rather that the failure to comply with licensure and statutory requirements that the businesses are operating illegally by definition. Some examples. The CO application that's been referenced multiple times here is actually dated from 2004. It is incomplete. And what you've hear, heard here are suppositions that something must have been completed, therefore the business license was issued. There's no evidence provided by the applicant or the city to support such an assertion. Secondly, the applicant themselves actually says that they started operating the business at the location in 2010, not 2004. Additionally, there's no evidence of a valid business license for Pixie Lily from 2010 through 2013, a gap of four years. There's no, uh, yeah, we've talked about the, the lack of business license, uh, the BLCOs um, in, 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 uh, in effect. Um, additionally, in their letter to the neighbors, the applicants quote, in the past five years, our tenants have included specialty food broker, PR company, interior designers, in addition to Leda's studio and warehouse, end quote. The applicant's use of the property as a warehouse is different, is a different non-conforming use than quote unquote office space. And again, there's no evidence provided that the zoning approval was obtained for such uh, a non-conforming use. Finally, I know it's been referenced that the second floor is not subject to tonight's meeting, However, the use of the second floor as office space specifically violates a prohibition in the zoning ordinance that prohibits non-conforming use to be used in, an, in a conforming use space. Real quickly, as it relates to the question of the actual use, um, as it relates to the, the four-part variance test, I previously submitted some comments to Mr. Batchelder when the application was originally made, the applicant made no attempt to support or confirm that they met any of the first three tests. The only part of the test that was applied was the fourth. So on its face, that application would fail. Additionally, thinking of it from a special exception perspective, I would argue a hair salon is not equally or more appropriate uh, use of the property compared to office space and would be detrimental to adjacent neighbors, myself included. The previous volume of activity was roughly one to two cars per day prior to the renovation. In this scenario, should a special exception use be granted, I'm less focused on the current tenants stipulations and assertions as to how they will operate, but I think we have to recognize that the board would be accepting that a hair salon is an appropriate use for that entire property. And one needs to understand and expect that the tenants will maximize their investment, whether it's the current tenants and applicants or someone in the future. So while there may be only a part of the ground floor in, um, being applied for today, once deemed appropriate, we have to assume that the entirety of the ground floor would be seen as an acceptable location to operate a hair salon across the entirety of the ground floor. So one has to assume at least double that capacity. My final point is there is no submit, nothing in the submission actually addresses the totality of the park, off street parking capacity for the property. As you can see, one half of the ground floor is intended to be one use. The other half of the ground floor has another use. The second floor would have yet another use as residential. The totality of those three uses by ordinance has a defined 
requirement for off street parking. That issue has not been addressed. The sole thing that's been addressed is that the uh, proposed tenancy uh, has, uh, has been given and will have four assigned parking spaces does not address whether the totality of the property can accommodate the totality of the uses. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Marzen. Uh, Penny, did uh, Mr. Rice sign up to speak? I see him here on the list. Uh, just one moment. Um, Mr. Batchelder? Yes, Mr. Um, James Rice did yes. sign up to speak. Okay. Batchelder. Yes. And he Ms. Ashby. Um, would you remind me the, the Pixie um, business? Was, was that a retail business or, or um, an office? I think it was an office for that business, okay. my understanding. Mr. Rice? Is, that, uh, is Mr. Rice the same gentleman who signed the letter that you summarized for us, Mr. Batchelder? Yes, yes. I, I did. And uh, my effort was to introduce our letter uh, to the board, but Mr. Batchelder has done that. Uh, I would like to just uh, mention that I did, in fact, meet with the Jacksons to see the property. And uh, when Mr. Maslon called me uh, for a meeting, I took it up with the board and we decided that uh, it was not appropriate to meet with Mr. Maslon. So there was communication, not just um, no comment. So thank you. That's fine. Uh, Mr. Rice, thank you for that explanation, mm -hmm. sir. Ms. Platt, are you there? Okay, Ms. Platt. Okay, um, so. Mr. Batchelder, we have um, John Adams that signed up to speak. Okay. I'm not seeing him on the list. Okay. Okay. I don't see him listed. Okay. Um, I have also signed up to speak is Susan Hort. Pardon? Um, Susan Hawk at 52 Society Street. Hey, okay. oh, yes. Ms. Howe? Ms. Howe. Thank you. Hello? Yes, Ms. Howe. Yes, let me, good evening. Let me, let me swear you in. Do you swear yes. to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Um, my name is Susie Howe. I live at 52 Society Street, which is my primary resident. 
It's an historic Charleston single house, and it's immediately adjacent to 48 Society Street. Um, the quality of my life and the peaceful enjoyment of my home is directly affected by the activities that I have a clear view of and can hear next door. My late husband, Weston Houck, and I have owned the property and lived on Society Street for almost 31 years. Um, in that time, we've seen this neighborhood inundated with great increases in noise, traffic, vehicular traffic, uh, carts, horses, carriages, pedicabs, you name it. Um, parking is often difficult on this street. Uh, needless to say, um, this street does not need more commercial activity and it's not desirable in a neighborhood that is tightly packed geographically and located on a narrow one-way street. Um, so I can hear everything that happens on this street, whether the firemen go to lunch at Harris Teeter, whether the kids are coming home from school, people chatting on the street, and the inaccurate information that carriage drivers are giving the tourists, um, and deafening construction noise. Um, so uh, I am opposing this um, on, on a number of, for a number of reasons. And I also wanna say that I concur wholeheartedly with uh, John Marslin and John Adams if he, if he is able to speak. Um, what's happened at 48 Society Street, in my opinion, is a slippery slope of commercial uses. Um, it's for, con, gone from a one-man travel agency that was grandfathered in in 1997 when they changed the zoning to become a, a multi-use office building, and now they want to expand that even further into a, a busy beauty salon. So I'm not sure, um, you know, I can't agree to the um, special exception variance test. I think it should, uh, excuse me, the special exception test, which is much easier to re meet than the um, variance. Um, my husband and I had a great, great deal of trouble with the former owners, uh, Mr. William McIntosh. Um, he rented to many unsavory tenants. He was not um, at, at the, in the least attuned to our issues with the problems and um, basically told us to buzz off. His zoning could do, he could do what he wanted with his zoning. So for these reasons, I again see a very slippery slope in granting any variance here. And I agree with John Marslin that, you know, the actual foundation for granting a variance is in question. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Howe. And I don't have anybody else on my list that I see in attendance. Penny, are there any other names in opposition we should call on? Just one moment, Mr. Batchelder. I, I do see one more person, a Jackie Meany. I'm here. Okay. All right. Great, thank you. So uh -huh. let me uh, swear you in. Okay. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. My name is Jackie Meany. I live at 34 Hazel Street, and I, like many others in my neighborhood, would like to register my opposition to the either use variance or special exception for 48 Society Street in historic Anson Borough. The use variance they are requesting for a hair salon is inappropriate for a historic residential neighborhood, and it will only compound the problems we are currently having with parking and traffic because of all of the hotels, condominiums, and apartment buildings that are being built around us. I would greatly appreciate your denial of this special exception or use request or use variance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Meany. Ms. Ashby, is anybody else uh, apparently ready to speak? 
Ms. Morrison, that's all that I have. All right. And, and again, um, before we leave this, my understanding is that there were a number of people that signed up to support it that are not being heard. And while I respect the board's time, I uh, believe that- my yeah, I was gonna will... let him speak in rebuttal, Mr. Maslon. Okay. Ask him with the stipulation, they all hold it down to a minute, please. All right, well, I, 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 for them, I would, I would like to have them be heard as well. So whatever is appropriate, if they could be called on and be allowed to speak. Thank you. Ms. Ashby or Mr. Batchelor, how many are you showing speaking favor? At least, um, Mr. Morrison, I believe I have at least five people all right, let's try to get through who's here. I can go on. I have um, Helen Rice. I see a Richard Rice. In the, uh... At 66 Anson. Whoever you can connect, let's just get them on. I'm not sure that those are the, the same household, according to my okay. I could be okay. wrong. Ms. Helen Rice there. Hello. Is this Helen Rice? No, no. This, this is no. Richard, Richard Rice. Rice. And, and we, are, we are, are speaking in opposition. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. All right, let's let's go back. Please proceed, Mr. Rice. Oh, I'm hoping I don't have an echo. Uh, I'll, I'll speak very briefly. Thank you, board, for giving me an opportunity. Listen, we have a unique situation. We purchased a house across the street from the subject property just three months ago. Um, we bought the house because of the res residential feel. We love the house. We love the neighborhood. We would have looked at the house very differently if there was a beauty salon across the street. It would have had a significant impact on price and our view on the neighborhood. I think if the salon comes in, I have to imagine it will have a significant impact on value and on appraised tax values. And I think all of that is clear indication that it's not an equally appropriate use for an existing business space that has a negligible impact on the neighborhood. And so I asked the board to uh, continue, maintain the current feel and, and deny the application. Thank you very much for giving me a chance to speak. Thank you, sir. And uh, Mr. Morrison, um, I'm, I'm not uh, being disrespectful, but I was communicating with my client who tells me that, that Ms. Helen Rice had signed up to speak, but that she may not have been able to stay around long enough to get back to them. So I'm not sure that she's still online, but I would like the record to show that we, we believe her to be a support of the application. All right, thank you, Mr. Maslon. Penny, anybody yes. else? Um, Nancy Snowden signed up to speak in support. I saw her name earlier and I'm not seeing it now. Let's see. Lee, I believe no, I she's that phone. Sorry, Lee, to butt in. I don't I believe see her. Her phone Hello? Hello? Oh. This is Nancy Snowden. Can you turn your mic off? Yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, I was having trouble at my house, so I'm over here at the Hudson's. Um, I'm speaking in support of um, of the application and Can the I ability to be um, in the neighborhood. In, because Nancy, I'm sorry. Let me swear yeah. you in first. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, of course. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you God. I do. 
Thank you. Certainly. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, I am speaking in support um, of the application. Um, the 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 structure of their business is to have only a couple of people there at a time, and um, and I you know the fact that they live in this neighborhood, it's it's just not. Um, I don't I don't think it's going to have the kind of impact that they're saying, and it's not going to be a bunch of noise and you know and all of those those sorts of things. And um, and, you're a and I'm a Hannah member, and that letter from Hannah does not reflect all of the residents in this neighborhood. And um, we weren't, I was not aware, and I've been a member of Hannah since I moved into this neighborhood, and I was not aware that there was a vote, and I don't feel that they should speak for the entire neighborhood. And I'm at the Hudson's if he, if they would be able to speak. I had requested to speak and was approved to speak. I'm Bill Hudson, if I could be sworn in, I just have a few statements. Uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do, and I respect this meeting, and I'll be brief. But we do support um, uh, the uh, uh, variants. Um, we know the Jacksons. Uh, we know they are reputable um, uh, landlords, and to uh, talk about the character of previous landlords is not appropriate. And um, my wife has lived in this area, visited her grandmother for many, many years has passed that residence. We live at 62 Society, 62 Society Street and have uh, been here for 20 years. And we are in support with many of our neighbors of um, this uh, uh, variance. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this, is, uh, this is Peggy Rinkin Hudson. I'd like to be sworn in, please. Can you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I, I do. Um, I am Peggy Rinkin Hudson. My grandmother grew up at 60, 53 Lawrence. My grandfather grew up at 32 Lawrence. This, this area, has, I'm sorry, society has always allowed for businesses to be here. We are in complete support of the Jacksons. We are members of the Hannah Group as well, and we do not, uh, we do not support that letter that Hannah sent. We think the Jacksons will, in fact, be very strict about who they allow as their tenants. We think the mixed use space is great, and I think you should al allow them to have this um, special exception approved. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. Thank you. Penny, anybody, anybody else? I think that's it. Mute. Um, I believe there, there are two more people that signed up to speak in support of Bill Key. Hello? Yes, uh, Mr. Yes. Key, do you, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. I am a 40-year resident of Ansonboro and Society Street. I have been a member of HANA for that same period of time. I would like to speak in favor of the variance and allowing the Jacksons to move forward with this business. I have known the McIntoshes and the Jacksons for the entire time that I've been here. They are honorable people. They will stand by their word in terms of staying with the city guidelines. I do not feel this business will allow, will create any increased noise or traffic on the street. I think their parking space will allow to make sure that there are no parking problems. And I would, just like to conclude, I'm in favor of this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Key. <clears throat> I, al I also have a Frank Lee that signed up to speak. I'm here, Mr. Batchelder. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, Mr. Lee, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I hope you got it. I do. Thank you. The first thing I want to say is hello to Mr. Robinson. I'm a retired pediatrician who took care of his children, and I haven't he, seen him in a long he, time. So he hey. can't hear you, Mr. Lee. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> what I wanted to say is I have been a resident in Ansonboro for 38 years. As long as I have been a resident on society, there has always been a business at 48 Society. I have personally known three generations of Macintoshes that have operated a business there. 
for many years, there was a busy Macintosh travel agency in that location with much foot and automobile traffic. There was never a problem, primarily because the location had ample off street parking. It, I'm also aware that there was also residences on the upper floors. A low impact commercial business has remained in that location even after the death of the former Macintosh owner. The building has, has, has had much physical decline over the years, but has remained somewhat presentable. I want to congratulate Lady Macintosh Jackson and her husband, Edward, for making a large financial commitment for the complete restoration of 48 Society. I have known them for a long while and find them to be responsible stewards and good neighbors. I understand that the proposed tenants for this building rarely see clients at the same time, con conducting much of their business off-site. There have always been businesses in Ansonboro. For those not aware, some of those businesses include the Sophia Institute at Society in East Bay. The property of, at Society in East Bay Streets have always been commercial, but they have always had good off-street parking. There, were, there was a huge bridal salon on the corner of Hazel and Anson Street which also was an art gallery, no, no off-street parking whatsoever. The Fountainhead Montessori School addressed on Meeting Street uses Our Society Street as its primary parking lot area and drop-off and pickup spots. There is a long operating liquor store at East Bay and Wentworth, no parking facility. A very busy law firm occupied Hazel Street for many years with no parking. The point that is hard to see how the proposed occupants of 48 Society with adequate parking will have any detrimental impacts on the neighborhood. Society Street has become a pass-through street from Meeting to East Bay, and there will be no going back, unfortunately. And our, the, the quality of life on Society Street has already been impacted such that I, I see very little impact from what is going to happen at 48 Society Street. I am grateful for the improvements and the restoration of this property, and I would recommend granting the variance as requested. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Does that do us? Uh, that everybody, Penny? Ms. Ashby? I believe so. I just want to make one clarification. Um, Mr. Batchelder, do you see Ross Smith um, who signed up to speak in support? Ross Smith here. Yes, Mr. Smith. Yes, sir. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a direct neighbor across the street. Uh, uh, three few months ago, uh, Ms. LaCroix offered uh, uh, to take me through her building and explain the use uh, of Ben Shelley, of uh, Maven moving there. Uh, I felt that sense of propriety and her enthusiasm for the neighborhood. Uh, was on par with mine and other owners uh, within this neighborhood. Uh, I don't see it affecting my life or sound or traffic. Uh, so I, I move forward with the variance. And, uh, take up, let me speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. What, Mr. Smith, one question. What, what is the address of your home? 59 Anson Street. All right. And Mr. Batchelder, I had two more people on my list, uh, Ms. Summerall and Frank McCann. I don't know if they're online, but they were on my list. Mr. Batchelder, I do see Ms. Summerall, Jenny Summerall. And I have Mr. McCann. On here, Mr. McCann. Yes, sir. Can you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do, and thank you for this opportunity to speak, Mr. Morrison. I'll speak very briefly. I first came to Society Street in 1978. You know, um, in 19, um, 35 years ago, I purchased my house at 59, uh, 56 Society Street, raised my family there, and still live there until the end. Um, the gentleman who I've never heard of, who say lives across the street, he moved here three weeks ago, three months ago, is opposed to the commercial aspect 
of uh, Ansonboro. There's not a neighborhood in Charleston that doesn't have a corner store, whether it be Burbage's, Queen Street Grocery, or whatever. And if he wants Snee Farm, God bless him. I don't know him. I'm not being dismissive of him, but if he came from Cleveland or wherever, and he wants a Snee Farm, he can go to Snee Farm because we are not Snee Farm in Ansonboro. We're a neighborhood. We're an uh, urban neighborhood. And that's what we've always been for 250 years. Uh, the, these complaints from Hannah, which I've been a member of since the beginning, are disingenuous. It's like, it's like they want Rainbow Row in Ansonboro. We're not Rainbow Row. So I'd ask you board members to, uh, to um, grant the variance and let the McIntosh building continue to be what it's been for hundreds of years or 150 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCann. We have Ms. Summerall ready. And uh, I, I overlooked one name. I think Ms. Montgomery is also waiting to speak. So I, you gotta I, quit add, adding names, Mr. Maslon. We're coming up on an hour here. I, I understand. <laughs> I, I'm just looking over my list of people that I think are waiting to All right. speak. Just those two, Montgomery and Summerall are the last two, I think. Ms. Montgomery? I'm here. Let me swear you in. Uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I hope you God. I swear. Thank you. Sure thing. So, I mean, I just have nothing but repeat statements from all the neighbors who are supporting this. Um, Bill Hudson said something that I really um, agree with that the past tenants really have nothing to do with what's happening now. And I, I totally agree with that. Um, I've known Meg for a really long time, this workman, um, and she's super respectful of her current neighbors now. And this is, you know, mere blocks from where she is. So I can only imagine she'll be as, as respectful to these um, business neighbors as well. Um, I think too, uh, everyone keeps talking about parking, which is hilarious. Um, Frank said something about like, this is what it looks like now that we're a city that is building and constructing. And I totally agree. This is how it's going. There's no going back. So um, these guys have delegated parking, which is awesome because I don't have that. Um, and all I see is all day long, there's trucks on the street as a pool. They're cleaning the pools. Then someone else is getting lawn care and that's a truck and a trailer. Then there's construction with crews and they take up all the parking spaces with their trucks. So these people who oppose this, those, those people are probably some of the ones causing the backup with their trucks and crews. So um, I just think that this is kind of the, the way it works now that we all live in a city. And if these people don't wanna live in a downtown city and deal with this and deal with construction and deal with more traffic and deal with more uh, foot traffic, then they're just gonna have to move, you know, go out where it's a little bit quieter, but this is kind of what it's like to live in a city. Um, and then these guys are opening a really, really high-end hair salon. And if you've never been in a hair salon, don't speak for them because you don't understand what it's like in there. It's quiet. It's posh. It's so, so special. And it's two girls who are going to have two clients at a time, maybe a third waiting. I can't imagine that they have a DJ hired with a dance party outside on the street. Like, I don't understand what the neighbors are complaining about when there's a brick wall between them and then a second brick wall between Meg and her coworker, I don't see how she's gonna be able to hear noise. Um, and just on a personal note, I have a small business in town. It's not in this neighborhood, but I, when I was opening my business, I had nothing but um, uh, community support in my neighborhood and it made all the difference. It made a huge difference in confidence and um, starting and thriving my business, especially through last year. So I just think local businesses um, add to the charm um, and the backbone of our city and gives um, that local community real uh, balance and you know, supporting local businesses, um, especially from someone who owns a small local business, 
you know, a hundred dollars spent in a local business, uh, like 60, something like $68 of that stays in the local community. So I'm just a huge supporter of local businesses in general and a huge supporter of Meg's as well. So thank you so much for your time, guys. Thank you, ma'am. I think that concludes it. I don't see Mrs. Summerall. Okay. Um, Mr. Maslon, if you think there are any new points that hadn't been touched on, I'll give you 30 seconds to finish your rebuttal. Otherwise, uh, we need to revert to the board's conversation on this. Yes, sir. Thank you. And, I, and I'll do my best. Um, on the, um, the very special exception um, issue, what, what I would ask the board to consider is uh, 54110 actually addresses what triggers a lapse and it is not based on the CO. It is abandoning the use or replacing it with a conforming use. So uh, again, I would urge you not to take that into consideration. The provisions of the CO are in a different section of the zoning ordinance 54-908. And again, if that's an issue, it's an enforcement issue. Factually, it's my understanding that McIntosh Travel was not a one-man operation. Uh, Ms. Jackson tells me that her father had seven employees in that office. And so um, to the extent that it, it is important, um, that was not just one person booking trips, but it was a thriving business and a busy business. So I appreciate your time and your patience, and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for those comments. All right. That ends the public comment portion of this meeting and uh, the board's deliberation now, if we will. Are there any comments or motions from the board, please? I would especially like to hear about whether there is agreement or disagreement with Mr. Batchelder's assessment that this is a not a use variance request. I would agree with Mr. Batchelder that it's a special um, exception request. It's just, since there are just four of us uh, in attendance and not recused, Mr. Jodan and, and Ms. Grass, do you have any concerns about this procedural issue, first of all? No, I don't. Mr. Jodan, uh, what is your sense of that issue, please? No, I don't. Uh, and I do agree that it, it's a, a special exception. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, yes. we can. Can you hear me? It's a special exception. Um, but, uh, the, 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 um, the bill itself is with the improvement that Mr. Jordan, we are, we're getting a bad transmission from you now, sir. I, we, we were able to hear, I was able to hear that uh, you believe this is a uh, special exception vote rather than a use variance vote. Is that correct? If he turns off his video, yes. the transmission might be better. Yes. Mr. Jordan, if you turn off your video. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can. Uh oh. Okay, I can't hear. We can hear you. How is exception? I think to proceed on all I and all negative and positive. It's feelings both ways, but um, I think we really need to go with the special exception with those rules. All right, so thank you. And uh, for the record, I agree as well with Mr. Batchelder's sense of this issue. Um, therefore, 
our vote will be by majority rather than by two thirds as would be required for use variance. And the issue before the board is whether this is an equally important or more appropriate, uh, equally appropriate or more appropriate to the district zoning and whether, whether this is an unreasonable intensification of the existing non-conforming use. I said that basically correctly, Mr. Batchelder? Yes. All right, are there any more comments or motions from the board? Um, I had one question regarding the parking. I think um, I had written it down too, and then um, Mr. Marslin uh, spoke about it regarding um, the parking for the additional uh, business uses, commercial uses of the building. Is that something that we need to address? It's, I mean, it seems the parking for this use is adequate, but it does concern me with the other uses within that same building. Where are they parking? Do we need to address that with this application? Well, I would say for these uses, uh, the two commercial uses uh, on the ground floor, that the total parking requirement would be um, based on the numbers uh, on this, these four plans. Uh, would be um, four spaces. Okay. Total requirement for parking. And then you've got a residential use upstairs that would have a requirement for two more spaces, so six total. Okay, so there's not a, the business upstairs. The children's clothing business is not upstairs? They're not going to continue to use that. Okay upper floor, they're gonna revert back to residential. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And so remind me please, Mr. Batchelder, the total so, number. Remind total, me, Mr. Batchelder, the total number. The total. total number would be six spaces for all uses. And, and the lot is how many? I believe it can hold six parking spaces, uh, perhaps, um, we could ask a question of Mr. Maslon about that, but I, I believe it can't hold that many spaces. And if you will give me a moment um, um, to check, but uh, my client tells me that um, there are a total of six spaces and um, they can easily fit six cars in there. All right, sir. Thank you for that. Uh, are there any other questions or comments from the board or, a, or any motions? I'm sorry to always be the one to ask questions, but I had one more regarding um, whether or not uh, we need to address if the salon closes um, and it, it did use for this property in the future. Um, Lee, can you address that? I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. I'm sorry. So if this salon closes, what would that mean for future use for this property? Well, if the another salon could come along and occupy that space, and be licensed without coming to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, or it could revert back to some sort of office or potentially some other use that would require another application before the board. Okay, that's what I wanted to know, thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. And there may be, the it occurs to me, the additional point to be made that if we, pass a motion tonight with specific stipulations about the use, those stipulations would, would remain in place uh, to be dealt with by any potential subsequent tenant. Okay. That's correct. Of course, the, uh, 
the stipulations discussed had to do with this proposed use. And as I understand the conversation, at least the gist of my questions, uh, one was to bar uh, use of premises for bridal parties or similar groups, which uh, the operator agreed to, if I understood her response. And uh, we talked about as well, um, the business of any, any filming and she also agreed to interior only, as I understood her answer, in the event that the anticipated uh, filming for the television show would occur several times during the year. So the chair cannot make a motion on this. So we're gonna need a motion if there's no more discussion from someone other than myself. I would make the motion to approve with the conditions uh, regarding the filming and the, the no large parties condition. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Can I ask for just a clarification, please? Does that, would those conditions also, of course, include the hours and days of operation listed on the agenda? Yes, yes, I, I forgot about those, yes. So, so those, those are in writing for purposes of the motion. The other two conditions. Those are writing for purposes of the motion. Sorry about that, but the other due conditions are no filming on site on the exterior of the site, which is a clean rule. And no party patronage of any size. I suppose a mother could bring in a daughter but uh, the proposal here for the operation is basically two patrons at a time, possibly a third uh, rotating uh, during the same time with, with two stylists in there and an agreement not to bring in wedding parties. I don't know if there's anything similar to wedding parties because I don't go into these kinds of places too much, but uh, how to word this provision is, uh, this condition is, should be fairly simple. It's your motion, Ms. Vargas Vargas, if you've got a proposal for how to word this stipulation, I'd appreciate it so Mr. Batchelder can get it properly. Uh, into the motion. Sure. Um, I, I don't think we need the booking friendly limit to bridal parties. I think groups, um, uh, the maximum occupancy was, I think, four, four chairs. Well, I think they were talking about two operating chairs and a third room, reception room with a third chair that uh, is used as Mr. Jones perhaps was describing for people waiting on coloring to take effect or whatever, whatever they do. So it sounds like their proposal, their plan, their business plan is three chairs. Okay. Two, two stylists. Um. What I'm struggling with is defining the group size because I, I agree that you know you may have 
um, you, you may have somebody um, with an appointment that may not come alone. Um, yeah, maybe, and maybe we could just leave it uh, with no, no parties, period. Yeah. And uh, rely on the on the judgment and goodwill of the operators, which they've expressed here tonight. Um, Mr. Trawick mentioned the limited hours, no groups of bridesmaids, no crowds and no parties, if that helps. Yes, that would, that would help. Agree with that. Yes. Any other stipulations before we call the vote? Looks like y'all covered it. All right. All in favor, please reply by saying aye, Ms. Vargas Vargas. Aye. Ms. Grass. Aye. Mr. Jodan. Aye. And Morrison votes aye as well. Motion carries with the stipulations. Thank you for your time and patience tonight. Thank you, Mr. Maslon. Mr. Batchelder, can you bring the real chair back now, please? <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> well, hour and 15 minutes. We, we did the best we could. You did a good job. And I guess we'll get Mr. Bennett back as well. We've got everybody back now. Welcome back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bennett. Unmute and take over. Thank you. Michael, can you hear me? You're muted still. I think Penny's going to take care of it. Oh, yeah. all right. I see her. Okay. Are we ready? Yes, sir, we are. Next item on the agenda is number A3, number 10 West Edge Street. Request special exception under section 54-206 parentheses Y to allow late night use restaurant and bar within 500 feet of a residential zone district, zone GB. Mr. Batchelder. Ten West Edge is a brand new building recently completed off of Lockwood Drive, just north of Spring Street. <clears throat> this uh, map shows the location and uh, <clears throat> The applicant submitted a, an application for a late night use special exception. This is required when the property where this use that would serve alcohol and stay open past midnight uh, is located is within 500 feet of a residentially zoned property. So here you have an aerial view and uh, 10 West Edge is this building right here. We've all seen it. This is Lockwood Drive. Police station is up to the left. Uh, Highway 17, Spring Street is right here on the south side of this building. Across the street, across Lockwood Drive is the Bristol Residential Condominium Building and a marina over here. The residentially zoned property is Brittlebank Park. 
and I'll, you'll see that in a minute on the zoning map. But this, this park area, which is Brittle Bank Park, has a residential zoning classification. Everything else around Penn West Edge is commercially zoned, including the Bristol. These are photographs of the existing building and the space is in this corner space. So Lockwood Drive is right here and the Bristol is off to the right of this image. And in that first floor uh, space within the building is where this late night use is proposed to be located. These are more photographs that show the space so you've got a, a large interior space, as well as this outdoor terrace that uh, wraps around the building on the two sides uh, that this uh, commercial space uh, fronts on. And of course, this uh, space over here in this photograph is right next door to Publix, the uh, new grocery store location over there. So the entrance is actually along West Edge. And this, this photograph shows you that, uh, in that uh, right here. And then you see, of course, the location on this terrace right here and inside the building. So here's a zoning map. And again, you see that the, the red uh, properties are all commercially zoned properties. Those, those are to the south and to the uh, west of the subject property of 10 West Edge. This blue zoning that applies to West Edge is a commercial zoning classification. It's just a different kind of a commercial classification that allows higher densities of residential development. And again, the, the residential zoning nearby is Brittlebank Park, shown here on the zoning map. That distance from the 10 West Edge property to Brittle Bank Park is 209 feet. And from the Bristol, I mean, from the, yeah, from the Bristol to the location of this business or the, the corner of this property where that business would locate is 135 feet. Now, the standards that apply are listed here. <clears throat> so I've, I've, emphasize the important language here. So establishments located in a structure uh, that is within 500 feet of a residential zoning district and allows for the consumption of alcohol after midnight uh, have to have your approval as a zoning special exception. And to grant that approval, you've got to make a finding that the garbage, recycling, maintenance equipment, and all that sort of thing are stored in a manner so as not to be visible in adjoining properties. The storage areas for all garbage, recycling, maintenance equipment are designed to contain odors, prevent wafting of odors. The location of the garbage and recycling pickup is safe. And measures have been incorporated into the structure to address adverse impacts of noise to properties in a residential zoning classification, or zoning district. <clears throat> and that the operation of the establishment will not be a substantial detriment to parking in joining residential zoning district. And finally, um, the establishment will not result in heavy concentration of establishments at the same time as the block. So just to do these in reverse order, sort of, so to speak, um, there's no other late night use in this immediate area, so there's no concentration to worry about. So six is not relevant to the discussion. Uh, they easily make, meet that finding. Um, number five, parking is provided on site in a parking garage. And uh, there's on-street parking as well along 10 West Edge. I believe in certain locations, but there is uh, adequate parking. So there's not gonna be any issue with uh, parking in, on an adjoining residential zoning district. Um, and then I'll, I'll come back to five or four 
But uh, one, two, and three all deal with garbage and storage areas and the pickup of garbage and storage and or recycling. Those are not issues here either. That, that would be a concern if we, we were dealing with a, uh, for instance, a King Street property maybe would have this concern or other properties that are closer to residential areas would certainly have this concern. But um, I don't believe that would be an issue you here. So I, I think that they've met one, two, three, five, and six. The question is number four, measures have been incorporated in the structure to address adverse impacts of noise properties, noise to properties in a residential zoning district. So back to the map, uh, we're dealing with Riddle Bank Park as a residential zoning district. And uh, there are no residences in Brittle Bank Park. So there's not, not going to be a noise issue for those, uh, for the park. Uh, we do have some concerns from folks that um, live in Bristol. <clears throat> and uh, as you can see from this map, they're 135 feet away directly across Lockwood Drive. Um, and certainly we don't want to adversely impact their quality of life. But I think that there are conditions that the applicant is agreeable to that would address those um, concerns. And uh, the applicant can speak to that. Uh, one of the things that I suggested was that they, in addition to the conditions they're proposing on the hours for the outdoor terrace seating area, that they also uh, uh, limit any amplified sound to not being higher than normal conversational tones. And that's, we've done that elsewhere uh, for these late night uses, especially when they had any outdoor service areas. And I think it's, it's worked pretty well. So if you have speakers outside to uh, allow for uh, music to be, uh, played, then that those loudspeakers should be kept to normal conversational tone limits and not be turned up. And that 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 would be, uh, I think, important in this case. So um, my recommendation is for approval of this request. I think they can meet the requirements of the special exception. And uh, I will um, let the applicant speak at this point, and I believe that is uh, Robbie Marty, who I will um, promote unless Scott wants to do that. Um, let's see here, I've got a bit out of that. There we go. And I should note that I do have some letters of uh, opposition from people in West Edge, and I'll, I'll read those at the appropriate time, but I think for the sake of the meeting, we can move on to the applicant at this point. Is the applicant present? I am. This is Robbie Marty. Uh, Ms. Marty, would you please uh, state your case? And let me swear you in first, by the way, but also, is there anybody else on your applicant team that would like to be like so, to speak? So um, Michael Maher and Sean Roscoe are on the list, but really um, I think Michael may speak, um, Mr. Maher may speak in sort of as in favor of, of the, the larger West Edge development. And Mr. Roscoe said he would only need to speak if there were specific questions that I was unable to address that the board had. Okay, thank you. So I'll go ahead and swear you in. So do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Okay. Glad to finally be on number two. <laughs> um, so, so this application, and, and actually, if, if we could go through, um, if, Lee, if you have the, yeah. um, the PDF sort of in, in order, if we can start on the, the first page, yes. So on, on this primary page, I, um, I laid out the, the six points that address the special exception. And I'd like to just simply go through those. I, 
I think that Mr. Batchelder did a, a good job of explaining exactly where this, this site is and um, its proximity to uh, other residences and also to the residentially zoned district. Um, so, so the first three points, the garbage storage and recycling link together. So um, Lee, if you could flip to page 11, um, which is the floor plan, I believe it's the last sheet of my PDF set. But there, go forward one more. There. One more. Oh, yeah. There you go. Here we are. Okay. So, so this is the um, this is the floor plan of the the proposed restaurant. You can see it's on the corner of Lockwood and West Edge. It um, it's adjacent to the Publix grocery store. There's an elevated, small elevated terrace on the um, north west corner of the property and um, and its primary entrance as Mr. Batchelder pointed out is on the along the west edge street. So the the trash and storage is going to be in stored in an enclosed room on the um, on the right hand side of the restaurant kind of towards Lockwood Boulevard. And then the the disposal of of any trash or recycling actually happens on the east side of the building, there's a really large um, loading zone bay that the Publix utilizes. And, and so the restaurant would be able to, to use that as well. So, so it's essentially 100% um, in house. So that, that kind of addresses the, the one, two and three points of the special exception. The, the number four point measures have been incorporated into the structure to address adverse impacts of noise to properties in a, in a residential zoning district. So there are a couple of things about this particular property that make this um, appropriate. So if you want to go to, I guess, page three of the, the PDF, um, it's the photographs of the, the site. So here, yeah, I mean, either one, any one of those that kind of show the terrace, maybe flip one back one more. Uh, that's perfect. So, so this is a large concrete building and the restaurant is, is fully enclosed. It has insulated impact glass windows. So any of the activity that's gonna happen within the restaurant is gonna stay in the restaurant. The um, really there are only two um, sort of opportunities where where there might be any kind of, of sound on the street and that would be from the use of the, the terrace and then also as as possibly as patrons are are leaving the um, the restaurant the the owners of the West Edge are I guess equally as concerned as any of the neighbors might be about this as it is a residential tower. And so they have written into their lease language that limits the hours of the terrace and also the noise level. And um, if you all don't have a copy, did that copy go around along with, with the, um, the, the drawings? Mr. Batchelder should or should? should I? I'm sorry. What 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 are you looking for? This is the this is the letter that the 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 West Edge building owners submitted in support. Right, right. This. Okay. Yep. So so I'm going to just read this. It's it's really sort of the longest part of, but it says it essentially says noise and patio hours. Tenants' work shall be constructed in a manner to prevent noise emanating for at the from the premise at a level which would constitute a legal nuisance, reasonably disturb other tenants of the building and or violate applicable codes and ordinances. During construction prior to tenant closing, the completed walls of the premises tenant in cooperation with the landlord will conduct noise and vibration tests to determine if any additional tenant work will be needed to dampen sound or vibration to prevent noise emanating from the premises, which would exceed maximum noise levels. And if so, the tenants will perform necessary work. Thereafter, tenant will not allow any noise to be emitted from the premise which exceeds maximum noise levels. Upon written notice from landlord that noise is emanating from the premise beyond maximum noise level, tenant shall take action immediately to correct the issue and if tenant and if tenant 
fails to reduce noise level below maximum noise levels within 20 days from the date, the landlord will have a right to place the tenant in default enlisting landlord to neglect to elect any and all rights or default remedies. Tenants temporary closure in order to make the necessary changes shall be permitted by landlord and shall not be deemed a closure which violates tenant obligations to operate from the premise. Tenant further agrees to restrict the hours its employees or guests or patrons may be served at a table on their outdoor patio with food or beverage service to no later than 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 11 p.m. Friday through Saturday. All employees, guests, and patrons must vacate the patio no later than 11 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and no later than midnight Friday through Saturday. Further, no live music or amplified music in any form shall be allowed on the patio after 10 p.m. So this is this is the the landlord's um, method to to control the issues for their own residential tenants. They're they're interested in in making sure that 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 stays to a, a reasonable level. Then, um, then if we continue to just look at the physical features and, and if you wanna just flip back to the, the photographs of the, the site, you can see that, that you know, it's a concrete building. On one side, it's, we have a, 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 a solid wall. There's a small kind of roof overhanging on the terrace. And, um, and those are all gonna to help sort of deal with the noise issue. And then the second thing, and I think that this is really important in one of the concerns that's that's come up with with the, the neighbors is is when people leave the restaurant, sort of the the idea that noise might patrons may spill onto the street and 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 sort of create a ruckus on Lockwood Boulevard. And and I, I would say that my point there is that is that because the exit is on the West Edge Street, the tenants, if you're meeting a ride share, you're gonna wait for your car on the side street. And if you drove, there is actually an exit from within the restaurant to the, the lobby space that is that they share with, with the public's grocery store. And the, the stairwells are also fully interior. So there's an opportunity to leave the restaurant not actually have to sort of leave the building proper and go to your car. So again, that just sort of reduces the, the opportunity for noise um, that might disturb the, the neighborhood. Um, then the last point of the, the special exception that, um, that I wanted to address is the parking. And, and as been alluded, there's more than sufficient parking <coughs> on site. And again, to get to that parking, one exits through the interior of the building. So again, um, sort of dealing with, with the noise issues, there would be no reason to park on, on Lockwood Boulevard or, or cause any detriment to the neighborhood from, from the impact of parking. Um, and that. Unless Lockwood Boulevard offers free parking and the parking garage does not. Maybe. So that is actually a, a question that maybe we could pose to the um, to the landlord. We'll if it's the landlord on Yes. So, um, so, Roscoe? So Sean Roscoe, yes. Uh, let me swear you in. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Uh, what was the question? Uh, presumably, the garage parking is not validated for patrons. It's a it's a charge. It is. Okay. And I don't think there are parking meters on Lockwood, and I don't think there are any actually in Brittlebank Park, are there? I Is do not know that answer. There are not meters on, on Brittlebank Park. I don't believe that there's street parking on Lockwood yeah, Boulevard either. Uh, I, I would agree with that. I don't think there's any street parking. Street parking, okay. Any other questions for Ms. Marty or Mr. Roscoe? 
Is anyone else present that wants to speak on behalf of the application? Mr. Robinson, I do have a letter of support from the West Side, the president of the West Side Neighborhood Association, Mr. George W. Palmer. Um, the applicant met, um, went to their meeting, and they voted um, to support a zoning exception for after hours restaurant bar at 10 West Edge. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else present wishes to speak on behalf of the pro of the application? Thank you very much. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak in opposition to the application? So I have uh, two public comments that were submitted that I can just simply uh, mention for the record. One came from Mary Lane Weckenman of 4014 Old Bridgeview Lane, which is the address for the Bristol. And uh, she writes that uh, she was, she's uh, writing you this email in opposition to the request for late night use. Uh, having one, having a late night bar will certainly impact our quality of life. We live directly across the street and we'll have to listen to the music at all hours of the day, night, and into the early morning it will affect our opportunities and on our balcony. And uh, the late night bar is not what we want to live near. Number two, having a late night bar could affect our property values. We purchased our condominium at Bristol because of the quality of the property and the enjoyment of the parks and amenities nearby. Um, people looking to live in fine residential condo in Charleston do not want to be across the street from a bar playing music and having patrons coming and going until 2 a.m. Um, and three, having a late night bar will increase traffic, increase the late night traffic at the intersection of West Edge and Lockwood and Old Bridge B Lane. Normally this intersection is quiet during the evening with a maximum amount of traffic, but as patrons come and go around 2 a.m., it will increase dramatically. Um, as you consider this variance, please put yourself in the place of residence of Penn West Edge. Would you want to live and sleep within 100 yards of the late night bar? I think the answer is that you know. Um, and also, Lee Rebet um, of Bristol as well, he lives in Bristol. Um, Dear members of the BZA, please deny this variance request for dining establishment to serve alcohol after midnight. My concern is the patrons of the establishment will be noisy as they enter and exit the facility, disturb the quiet enjoyment of neighbors across Lockwood. We now hear music from Marriott's Aqua Outdoor Bar, which is much farther than 500 feet away from us. Sound carries far, especially in the evening hours when there's less traffic on Lockwood. We are fortunate to live next to Brill Bank Park. However, these events, um, the site of many public festivals and gatherings throughout the year. However, as these events begin to occur again, I'm concerned about the potential convergence of festival energy with likely noise, music, elevated noises, or voices from the outdoor dining bar music venue across the street. And Penny, I don't believe anybody signed up to speak in opposition. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Batchel. Okay, thank you. Ms. Marty, did, did you have any um, conversation or any um, contact at all with the HOA at, at the uh, Bristol? So we, we reached out to the HOA and actually on two separate occasions sent letters to the, the residents at the Bristol because, you know, we were interested in, in getting their feedback and making sure that they understood what we were asking for. And, um, and these, these two letters are the only things that we received back and the HOA was not responsive to us. Very good. Uh, in rebuttal to the letters of opposition, Ms. Martin. So as, as I've already stated, the, um, the, the combination of 
of the the closing hours on the terrace, the limiting the the sound of music, and then the direction from which one would exit the restaurant <laughs> either into the building or along the West Edge Street, I think would mitigate any sort of noise concerns that would um, that would impact the, uh, the the Bristol condominium. And and further, I think that that one of the things that that sort of comes up with this is that one might imagine when one hears late night that you know you think about Upper King Street and the very reason that this ordinance was written was to to sort of address that to try to diversify bars and restaurants in the city so that they are they're not concentrated together and and as was pointed out in the application this is the only restaurant of this um, of this type within the, um, the 175 feet so the concentration is extremely low and we feel like the impact would be would be ne excuse me negligible and and quite honestly I think it would be a um, it, it would actually be a positive for the the residents in the the west edge and and in the west side neighborhood thank you Thank you very much. Any questions, comments, or motions from the board? Move approval. Um, can I ask, can I say something first? Or yes. I... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I apologize. Um, I'm interested in going back to what Mr. Batchelder um, said, just based on the um, concerns raised about the outdoor music and noise. Um, Mr. Batchelder had mentioned that we could um, add a condition for no amplified sounds higher than normal conversation. Um, is that, do you think that applies to this application, Mr. Batchelder, or were you just stating that in general? No, I was uh, recommending that for this application, and I, and that's for the outside areas. Right, okay. right. Any other questions? I have one other, just a Piggyback on that question, Ms. Grass, is the, um, and this may be a question for um, for the landlord, does the noise level that, that we would pr put a, propose to put a condition down for constitute the maximum noise level in that tenant agreement? I believe it does. Okay. Any other questions? We have a motion on the floor and Mr. Um, Morris. I, I would like, uh, I would like to amend to take into consideration uh, the comments about incorporating Mr. Batchelder's recommendation, especially because of the fact that I think it's a little vague about maximum noise level being defined as what constitutes a legal nuisance because that is a big debate in itself. And even our approval of this variance will be used as evidence that, it, that it's not a legal nuisance if they ever have a fight about that. So I think we'd be wise to vote on a motion that has some real specificity about noise levels. I agree with that. What did you have in mind, Mr. Morrison? To incorporate Mr. Batchelder's uh, stipulation that, what was it, Lee, after midnight, no amplified, no live outside, no amplified above conversation level outside, was that it? Uh, at all hours that there would not be any sound amplified above normal conversational tones. That really outside. bars that really bans amplification, does it not, of all types outside, which is in, uh, they've got in this, and we're talking about two things, incorporating what's in, in the letter in front of us as a, word for word as a stipulation, are we not? And Lee's, uh, Additional condition. Additional wording. Yeah, I think you've got, uh, Mr. Morris, and I, uh, not to step into your motion, but I think you would make the comment that a subject condition of, of no 
sound uh, at levels louder than conversational tones outside at any time. And then uh, also condition on the letter uh, from the development manager. I think those are the two conditions you, you probably are talking about. Yeah, that that works for the motion. Is there a second to that particular motion? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye, Mr. Morrison. Aye. Mr. Judan. Mr. Ms. Grant. Aye. aye. Ms. Vargas Vargas. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Robinson votes aye. The motion is unanimously approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is B1, 2120 Booker Street, Silver Hill, Magnolia. Request special exception under section 54-501 to allow construction of a single family residence on a lot of insufficient size, lot area 2,722 square feet, 9,000 square feet required. Request a variance from section 54301 to allow construction of a single family residence with a 2.5 foot front setback steps, a three foot rear setback steps, 5.5 foot total front and rear setback, a 7.5 foot east side setback, a 7.5 foot west side setback, a 15 foot total side setback, Having a 54% lot, lot occupancy, 25 feet, 25 feet, 50 feet, 9 feet, 9 feet, and 8 feet required, 35% lot occupancy limitation, zone SR1. Mr. Batchel. Thank you. This is a proposal to build a new single family residence on the lot shown on this map. And as you can see, the lot on this map that we're talking about is the same pretty much the same exact size as the other lots on that block. And uh, as we go through this, you'll see that those other lots are uh, mostly occupied by single family residences. So the applicant submitted their application. Here's the aerial view. This is the lot in question uh, right here with that blue uh, line around it. And you see the other homes and this map also illustrates that with the um, building footprints. So the proposed single family residence on this lot um, of insufficient size is, is warranted due to the fact that this is a lot in a neighborhood that happens to have very small lots. And, and uh, there are many other lots in this neighborhood of similar or smaller size that do have lot homes on them. So I think that's, uh, certainly should be approved. And the setback variances and lot occupancy uh, variants are warranted as well due to the small size of this lot and shape. And uh, you'll see in the site plan that this proposed footprint uh, fits on the lot and, uh, and is similar in, in many respects to other homes in this neighborhood. So uh, this is a two-story house to the elevations right here, and we recommend approval. I don't believe anybody signed up to speak in opposition or submitted comments. Is that correct? Mr. Batchelder, I have received a petition from the owner of the property with names of neighboring residents in support of his application that live on Booker. Trescott, Silver Street, and Amaker. And Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. Ashby, but there are no letters of opposition? No, sir. No letters of opposition. Thank you. Mr. Thank Matt, you. What is your recommendation? My recommendation is for approval of this request. The city recommends approval. There is no opposition. Uh, the uh, uh, Ms. Grass makes a motion for approval, seconded by Ms. Vargas Vargas. All in favor signify by saying aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Mr. Judon? Aye. Ms. Grass? Aye. Ms. Vargas Vargas? 
Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Robinson votes aye. The motion is unanimously approved. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is 11 Anson Street. Request a variance from section 54 301 to allow two story addition, sunroom slash closet, having a 61% lot occupancy, 35% limitation, existing lot occupancy, 56%, zone CT. Mr. Batchelder. This is a commercially zoned residential property. So it's just north of uh, Pinckney Street in Ansonboro on Anson Street and uh, has a house on it that occupies a large part of the lot, as you can see in this aerial view, a very tight uh, lot there. And they're proposing to build a small addition in the back. Um, here's the zoning map showing that it's commercially zoned property. So this is the existing building footprint. Right, and uh, so photographs of the property, more photographs. They wanna build an addition um, in the area of this um, back portion of the existing house. Existing elevations, so proposed footprint. So. This is the addition right here, the sunroom addition. And upstairs there would be, an, uh, this is a two-story addition, correct, Penny? Yeah, two-story addition, closet upstairs. So sunroom on the ground floor, a closet upstairs. Um, this is a request that will have to go through the BAR as well and receive their approval. So I know that there might be some concerns about the, the um, appropriateness of this, can, of this addition, but I really feel that's a BAR issue, not a zoning issue. I feel like on these small lots uh, with these very tiny houses that um, you know, reasonable sized additions are are fine from a zoning standpoint. So, and I don't believe we've got any opposition from anybody. Is that correct, Penny? That is correct. And we do have in support a letter from the neighbor to the south at 30 Pinckney Street. Okay. So the owners our, are, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The owners are Daniel and Kelly Mina. Okay. So, our, my recommendation is for approval of this request. I feel like the, the size and um, shape of this property is such that uh, the uh, variance is warranted. So my recommendation is for approval. The city recommends approval. There is no opposition. Motion is made by Ms. Vargas Vargas for approval, seconded by Mr. Bennett. All in favor signify by saying aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Mr. Jadon? Aye. Ms. Grass? Ms. Grass? I know. I'm sorry. I couldn't unmute it. I apologize. I, aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Ms. Vargas Vargas? Aye. Mr. Robinson votes aye. The motion is unanimously approved. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is number B3, 13 Green Hill Street, Charlestown. Request special exception under section 54-110 to allow vertical extension, second story, master bath, closet expansion to a non-conforming building footprint, uh, footprint that does not meet the required three foot north side setback, zone DR1, Mr. Batchel. So this is a residence uh, south of Broad in Charlestown neighborhood. And uh, see the lot here. See an aerial view. It's a two story house, but the area where the proposed addition is located is a one story. Actually, it's a two story 
section on the back, but the second story is not, doesn't cover the footprint of the ground floor. So we'll see in a minute here. Um, zoning map, so photographs of the property, more photographs. So it's this area right here um, where this change is proposed, and that's on the back side of the house if you're looking at it from Green Hill. So you see the existing site plan, and uh, keep looking at this area right here. So you got a one story addition there. A ground floor addition there that is the kitchen and a porch. And uh, so again, here's the ground floor right here. This is the existing second floor. So you see the enclosed portion of the second floor is smaller than the ground floor section right here. And uh, moving to the proposed. So you see that this, this stays the same essentially, but the upstairs portion expands so that its footprint matches the footprint of the lower story. So that's the nature of the uh, request before you tonight. And uh, again, here's an Here's the existing roof elevations that will more clearly show this. Existing elevations, existing elevations, <clears throat> and the proposed site plan, proposed roof, proposed elevation. So, anyway, <clears throat> it's a very minor addition in size but it does require your approval. The, name, the applicant rather has secured these letters from the uh, neighbors of this property to indicate that uh, they support the proposal. So the uh, Turners at 15 Green Hill Street, Haley's at seven Green Hill Street, and that's it. So our recommendation is for approval of this request. City Rue most uh, recommends approval. Um, Ms. Uh, Ashby, is there any opposition? No, Mr. Robinson, no opposition. No opposition. Ms. Vargas Vargas moves for approval, seconded by Mr. Bennett. All in favor signify by saying aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Mr. Gadon? Aye. Ms. Grant? Aye. Ms. Vargas Vargas? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Robinson votes aye. The motion is unanimously approved. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is B4, 16 Shepherd Street, East Side. Request special exception under Section 54-501 to allow construction of a single family residence on a lot of insufficient size, lot area 2,232 square feet. 2,500 square feet required, zone DR2F, Mr. Batchelder. Vacant lot in the east side neighborhood. And uh, you can see from this map that it's very similar in size and even larger than some of the uh, nearby lots in that block. So not an unusual size by any means. Here you'll see that some of those other lots, many of those other lots actually have single family homes on them. And that is what is proposed for this lot. Now the map showing the surrounding lots with homes on them. This is a ground floor. So this, this is in an area where you can have a three-story house under the height regulations. And uh, that's what's proposed here. Ground floor is in a flood zone, so they're going to have parking on the ground floor and then uh, <clears throat> living space above. And the house would be a three story house with two floors of, of occupied space. Um, 
But uh, and you can see that um, the only issue is the lot of insufficient size. There's no setback issue. There's no parking, not uh, parking variance requested. Only the lot of insufficient size request, and we recommend approval of this request. City recommends approval. Uh, Ms. Ashby, is there any opposition? No opposition, Mr. Robinson. Mr. Bennett uh, moves for approval, seconded by Mr. Morrison. All in favor signify by saying aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Mr. Yudon? Aye. Ms. Grass? Aye. Ms. Vargas Vargas? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Robinson votes aye. The motion is unanimously approved. Next item on the agenda. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bennett uh, must recuse from this item, so he will not vote. Thank you. Next item is 35 State Street, French Quarter. Request variance from section 54301 to allow a stair addition with a zero foot rear setback, having 72% lot occupancy. Three feet required, 35% occupancy limitation, existing lot occupancy, 67% zone SR5, Mr. Batchelder. So in this case, we have a existing residence on State Street in the French Quarter. The applicant uh, would like to uh, construct a stair to allow access from the roof down to the ground. Um, and it would be located at the very back of the existing house in a small area on the lot. And that increase in the footprint, the building size uh, requires your approval as well as a setback variance. So um, here is the set of plan. So the building is um, shown here. It's this, this uh, three-story townhouse building. And at the very back of that building is a small area on the lot that would allow uh, the stairway to be constructed. This zoning map shows you the surrounding property. So you have, you have the uh, property immediately to the south, uh, which is right here. And then you have two properties to the north that abut this lot. The subject property 37 State Street right here, and then 39 State Street actually wraps around the back side of this property. So we said to the applicant, we'll go talk to your neighbors and, and uh, get their support, or at least get them to not object to the request. And you'll see that they've done that. <clears throat> um, here is the existing townhouse building right here. And you see the small area at the back of the lot behind the building. That is where they would like to build the stair as shown on this plan. So they, they want to uh, basically expand the building footprint with the stair, which is part of a building and therefore counts as part of the building footprint. And uh, we will also, of course, go back to the uh, rear a property line or six inches off the rear property line to meet the setback variance there. Um, so, um, more information. Let's see here. I got hearings here. Okay. Here's a close up view, uh, aerial view looking down into that space, and then a photo looking up at the back of the house where the their location would be, uh, example of what that would be. And uh, th these are the letters from the surrounding property owners. So two letters from owners of uh, the units at 33 and a half State Street, Mr. Pope and uh, Caitlin Howard, Betsy Douglas at 33 and a half State Street. And then the owners of uh, 37 State Street, um, the Zaris, I pronounced that right. And then the uh, applicant indicated that they have attempted to contact the owner of 39 State Street, but were, uh, but they, those folks were not responsive. Apparently they don't live here uh, very much of the time. So anyway, 
we recommend approval of this request. Um, it's a very small addition at the very back of the property in an area that's really not very usable right now. So uh, we recommend approval of the request. City recommends approval. Uh, Ms. Ashby, is there any opposition? No, Mr. Robinson, no opposition. No opposition and the neighbors are um, okay with the uh, recommendation. Uh, Mr. Hal moves for, uh, Mr. Ha excuse me, Ms. Morrison moves for approval, seconded by Mr. Judon. All in favor signify by saying aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Mr. Judon? Aye. Ms. Aye. Ms. Uh, Vargas Vargas? Aye. Mr. Uh, Robinson uh, uh, also votes aye. The motion unanimously passes. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda. Uh, did you bring Mr. Bennett back yet, Mr. Bachelor? Yes. Next item on the agenda is 24 Limehouse Street, Charlestown. Request exception, special exception under section 54110 to allow one story addition, dining room expansion den extends a non-conforming 0.2 foot east side setback, three feet required. Request a variance from section 54301 to allow a one story addition, dining room, expansion, den, and to allow a one story covered porch, stairs and raised patio, having a 39% lot occupancy, 35% limitation, existing lot occupancy is 32, 33%. Zone DR1, Mr. Batchelder. Residential property on Limehouse Street, just north of Lowndes. And uh, let's get right to the plan. So you see there's a main house on this lot, the, the house on the north side of the property. And then there's a smaller accessory building, which contains a second dwelling unit on the south side in the back corner. So there are additions to both buildings and uh, aerial view of the existing site plan showing the existing more information. Um, the applicant submitted some information about other surrounding lot occupancies in that zoning district, which are the properties in orange. So very high and what they're proposing is not nearly as high as, as those. So, uh, but you'll see in a minute, these are just photographs of the existing building. You will see that um, the changes are pretty minor. So here you have, here's the existing footprint with that covered porch extending to the side, south side of the main house. And here you see the proposed addition, which would replace that Porch. This is the addition right here that I'm putting my cursor around. And, uh, and then there's this outdoor terrace area and so forth. But um, it's really this addition right here that requires the approval. And then a screen porch here, of course, as well. But, um, and then over here, they are proposing to replace this existing stair right here that's shown in the red dashed line and uh, extend the porch over and then build a new stair in this location. So that basically extends that non-conforming, uh, well, it doesn't extend that, non but it increases a lot of occupancy. That's what I meant to say. So that's the issue there. Um, and these are the floor plans showing the existing and proposed. And there's really not much change here, but you see how the roof over that ground floor uh, grows quite a bit. And the changes in elevation are shown here. Here's the new addition. And that's from the backside. 
So this is the portion that requires the approval of this, this portion right here. And then for the accessory building, these illustrate the changes that are proposed with that extended porch and new stair staircase. So that is the uh, request and uh, our recommendation is for approval. We asked the applicants to go contact the, the uh, neighbors and they did that. And those neighbors have indicated, uh, here's a email that we received from the Riley's at 20 Gibbs Street, indicating that they're fine with the proposed changes. Uh, Ms. Edmonds at Two Limehouse Street, and the Dailies at 19 Greenhill Street, which would be to the rear, and uh, the Kohlers at 22 Limehouse Street. So, and even more, we've got Ms. Crocker at 26 Limehouse Street. So, lots of uh, people have been contacted and have not objected to this. So our recommendation is for approval to allow these changes. City recommends approval. Ms. Ashby, is there any opposition? No, Mr. Robinson, no opposition. No opposition. Mr. Judon moves for approval, seconded by Ms. Grass. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Mr. Morrison. Aye. Mr. Judon. Aye. Ms. Grass. Aye. Aye. Ms. Vargas Vargas. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Robinson votes aye. The motion is unanimously approved. Mr. Robinson, um, forgive me, please. Who made the motion? Uh, the motion was made by Mr. Judon. Thank sir, you. Dr. Grass. Thank you, sir. Next item is number seven. Mr. Bennett uh, is going to recuse from this item as well. It's 26 Montague Street, Harleston Village. Request special exception under section 54110 to allow a horizontal expansion and vertical extension that extends a non conforming six inch east side setback. Kitchen expansion, elevator, mudroom, family room, screen porch, bedrooms, baths, three feet required, zone DR1F. Mr. Batchel. So, uh, residential property in Harleston Village large lot, big house, and I'm just going to skip right to it. Here's an aerial view showing the large lot and house. The house sits all the way over on the east side of the property, against that property line. And uh, I'm going to just skip right to it. So the only way to really show this is an elevation because the plans are very hard to understand if you unless you uh, have an opportunity to study them for a little while. But these are the existing elevations, north and south. So basically front and rear elevations and uh, on the top and then the proposed elevations on the bottom. So if you focus back here, you see the, the back of the house is kind of a jumble right now. And uh, what is proposed are additions that will change that significantly. And you can see the, the new addition here that will extend uh, the existing building footprint out a little bit. So on the side view, the existing elevation looks like this. And you can see the proposed elevation right here. So. This wall is a little bit further back than the existing rear of the house. So there's that extension. And then there's this infill portion right here on the second floor. Um, so those two aspects of the changes require your approval. Um, and uh, we feel that they've met the special exception uh, test this and recommend approval. City recommends approval. Ms. Ashby, is there any opposition? No, Mr. Robinson, no opposition. 
to opposition. Ms. Grass moves for approval, seconded by Ms. Vargas Vargas. All in favor signify by saying aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Mr. Janan? Mr. Janan? Ms. Grass? Aye. Ms. Vargas Vargas? Aye. Mr. Janan? Uh, Mr. Robinson votes in favor, and we can't raise Mr. Judon, so we have. Uh, let me, we have. Yes, I'm oh, available. Oh, you are okay. Are you in favor? Good. Yes, sir. Uh, the motion is unanimously approved. Thank you very much. All right, last item on the agenda is number eight. It is Mr. Bennett back? Mr. Batchelder? Yes, I'm ready. Is Mr. Bennett back? Yes, he is. Good. Number eight is Verbena Lane, Apiary Lane, and Mead Lane, Laurel Oaks. Request variance from section 54-301 to allow construction of three-story single-family residences, lots one through 32, that exceed 35 feet in height. Limit is two and a half stories, 35 feet, Zone SR1, Mr. Batchelder. So this um, Laurel Oaks is a uh, new residential development in West Ashley. And this map shows the location. So you have, you have Highway 17, Savannah Highway coming right here. You have uh, Bees Ferry Road. The old Bees Ferry Road right, right of way is what provides access into this property, but that street that no longer connects to Highway 17. So there's this new access point uh, to Savannah Highway right here. But this is the property that's uh, way out in the city of Charleston, in West Ashley. And uh, the situation is that this new neighborhood uh, was started uh, as far as the permitting process goes several years ago. And these things take a while to get through the process and get built and then have homes built. And uh, they're right now at the, just starting on the home building uh, part of the neighborhood. So it's taken a while to get through the permitting and the infrastructure, construction, road construction, all that sort of thing. And uh, they've ended up in a, in a bad situation because the neighborhood from the very beginning was planned to be a neighborhood uh, that would take advantage of the flood zone elevation requirements and build two stories, two story houses over a one story garage. Um, so a three story house and, and then SR1, which is the zoning for this property, you're limited to two and a half stories. We don't count elevations within flood zones. So people elevate their first floor for flood zone reasons. And uh, they can have two and a half stories above that, that um, ground level garage or storage or crawl space. In this case, uh, the change in the flood zones that happened in January when the federal government adopted their new flood maps, uh, or when they took effect rather, um, changed things for this neighborhood. And now this neighborhood, uh, which, which is shown here and was planned to be a, what we call a cluster development. Now they're gonna be called conservation developments. But the fact, the, the, the idea is that you take a, a, a piece of land and you cluster the homes and the infrastructure in certain locations to save uh, other parts of the property as open space, save trees, sort of that sort of thing, uh, natural features, all, all that sort of thing. So that's what they've done here. And you end up with smaller lots, uh, smaller yards, and, uh, and situations where a three-story house versus a two-story house makes sense. 
And that was the idea behind this neighborhood. Uh, but the flood zone requirements changed. So the elevations of the pads where you would start the construction of the home are about 11 feet, give or take a little bit, throughout this entire neighborhood. And you see here that this is the old flood zone certification. It was an AE10, which means under the city rules, you had to be at 12 feet with your first floor. So you couldn't build right on, on grade, you had to elevate and you can elevate further um, as long as that ground floor story is below the base flood elevation and not permitted to be a habitable space, a conditioned space. So that's what they did, again, under the old flood maps. And these are the homes that they uh, would like to build. This is the model home, the first home that they did build under the old flood zone regulations. But now these new maps have come in and now a substantial part of the um, neighborhood is no longer in a flood zone at all. It's in an X zone, which means there's no flood elevation requirement. And the remaining lots are in AE7, which under the city rules means you've got to elevate to nine feet. Well, their slabs are already above that that they want to build on. So the so they're in a situation where they can't build what they intended to build in the beginning. And, and I think, think that that has created a hardship for them because these lots don't work otherwise. If you had to, if you had to put a two story or two and a half story house with a garage or driveway or something like that on this, these lots, it just doesn't work. So, <clears throat> so my recommendation was for them to seek a variance because I felt like the, the properties suffered a hardship as a result of these changing laws, which they have no control over, the city has no control over. So uh, my recommendation is for the board to approve these uh, variances or the variance to allow the three-story homes on these lots uh, so that they can continue their development. And uh, these are just uh, views of their existing neighborhood. You can see it was all ready to be um, built out. And uh, the change in, in the flood zone regulations has, put a, has, has made that difficult. So uh, my recommendation is for approval of this request. It doesn't, wouldn't adversely impact anybody because as you can see, there's no neighboring properties uh, around this, this property that would be impacted by a three-story versus a two-and-a-half-story house. And um, I'll just point out, all this land up here, this is all open space. It will be part of the HOA property uh, once all these homes are built. People will get to enjoy that land up there. So that's our recommendation. And I know the applicants are on the call if you have any questions, but I... I urge you to support this. The city recommends approval. Ms. Ashby is in <coughs> opposition. No, Mr. Robinson, no opposition. Can I ask a question? Anyone on the board have any questions? I, I do. Um, so does this mean that because it's in the conservation zone that um, it, it won't be developed further than what we just saw with the plans? Uh, right. The the all that additional land that did not have any lots on it, that's all open space. All this land is preserved. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Any motions? Move approval. Second. There's an approval in a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Mr. Morrison. Aye. Mr. Jadon. Aye. Ms. Grass. Aye. Ms. Vargas Vargas. Aye. Ms. Bennett, ben, Mr. Bennett. Aye. <laughs> aye. Mr. Robinson votes aye. The motion is unanimously approved. Thank you very much.
Mr. Robinson, I'm so sorry. Who made the second motion, please? Mr. Bennett. Thank you, sir. Thank you all very much for your perseverance. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank enjoy, you all. Enjoy Thank meeting you. your cat, Hazel. Did you? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I miss